On today's part of my take, we have Todd McShay. Todd, 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 Todd. On to talk about the NFL draft. We're finally here. It is draft week. We are going to recap a little UFC. A uh, lot of storylines coming out of that. Maybe some baseball talk. We have who's back of the week and a Monday reading. And is all brought to you by our friends at BetterHelp.com. Listen, at Barstool Sports, we truly love and appreciate our listeners. We love you. All the AWLs out there, we love you. So we're going to get serious for a second here because last year has been hard on a lot of people, and that's why we're doing something new and partnering with our new sponsor, BetterHelp Online Therapy. A lot of us take care of our bodies, but with this tough of a year this has been on many of us, we might also want to think about taking care of our minds. There's a misunderstanding of what therapy is. It can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be sitting around talking about your feelings. It can be, you know, someone, hey, just a, a, some someone to listen to how your day was or what you're looking forward to or what you're anxious about going forward. Better help can help with a lot of different things. A lot of people batter with their temp, battle with their temper or their stress is too much to manage, or they have depression, anxiety, PTSD, the list goes on and on and on. If this is you, you can use therapy to get some tools that make life easier. So go right now. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. I know there's a ton of excuses to not work on your mental health. I know there's a ton of excuses not to get a therapist. Well, now you have one less excuse because you don't even have to leave your house. And that's why BetterHelp is the best. Join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are the greatest asset. You are your greatest asset. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash PMT. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash PMT. Seriously, guys, if you're even thinking about therapy, if you have even thought about therapy, or just want someone to talk to, betterhelp.com slash PMT is the place for it. Okay, let's go. Welcome to Part of My Take, presented by betterhelp.com. If you want to get uh, into therapy, if you want to talk to a therapist, online chat with a therapist, you don't even have to leave your house, betterhelp.com slash PMT, 10% off for our listeners for the first month at betterhelp.com slash PMT. Today is Monday, April 26th. And it is draft week, and Roger Goodell going to get all up in everyone's fucking grill. All up in the guts. Love it. Players are going to be allowed to hug Roger Goodell this year. He's going to go so hard on his first couple. You know he's been – he just wants to touch. He just wants to touch these these young men who are going to uh, be under the tutelage of Roger Goodell, and he's going to change their lives. He's going to back slap, butt slap, maybe even a little mwah-mwah kiss yeah i french i I hope that they do like there was one year where he came pretty close to kissing a player yeah sometimes roger he just likes new players being in the league and he he, he's watched the tape he's got to make up for it yeah he's he's definitely had like some intricate handshake planned for the last year we're not going to get to see him down in his basement again this year maybe that's what the maybe the first person across the stage will be the green Mm m&m and roger goodell horny m&m yeah roger bonk just yeah just butt fucker eat it up you guys think he'll make any more false promises about donating to charity and, and sitting next next to him during a game mm, in his man cave? Yeah, probably. Why not? Put it past him. Yeah, why not? Mm-hmm. I mean, he once you once you do it once and and everyone's like, "Damn, that was really nice," and then you don't have to do it. Then you just do it all the time, right? People don't really talk about that enough. No, That's they true. don't. It's a good point. Is it? Dis- and I was going to match that too. Right. Uh, me too. I was going to match it, and, but I was going to give my share to the control room. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's tough. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I was going to match if Roger did it, but I can't now. So. That's expired. My offer has expired. Do you think it's disrespectful to Roger Goodell if a player chooses not to attend the draft? Ooh. You think they're, you think Roger looks at them for the rest of their career like you had your chance to hug me and you didn't? I think Trevor Lawrence isn't going to attend, right? I'm pretty sure yeah. he's not attending. He's not attending. It's the the old, Joe Thomas the Joe going Thomas. on the go fishing. Yeah. That's what I would do. I mm-hmm. if I were to be drafted, I would do jo- I would go fishing with Joe Thomas's dad yes. instead of being drafted. Yes. Yeah. And and see, I mean that would probably be better than sitting in a green room. And having to, because it is, he is going to go out of control hug. Yep. His first one, 
He's not going to hold anything back. And now, are there fans going to be at the draft? Yes. Yes. So, boos are back? Boos are back. Yes. Roger Goodell. Oh, remember? Get oh, my God. I'm cringing now thinking about last year. Remember when he had the digital boos? And he's like, bring it on. Uh-huh. I love to hear it. Oh. But either way, the draft week is great. I know it has felt like it's taken forever. It definitely feels like it should have been last week or the week before. But we're finally here. Draft week. Tons of NFL talk. We have Todd McShay coming up. I'm getting more and more nervous about which quarterback the Bears are going to reach for. Um, and then I'm calling I just, it right now. They're going to draft Kyle Trask, <sighs> and then he's going to stink, and your life will be made a living hell by a quarterback who sucks that looks exactly like Billy Football. Well, you know, if it was really truly to be a living hell, it would be that he's good for a little bit. And then everyone keeps their job. Yeah, it would also be very Bears, though, to do the exact same thing that they did with Glennon a couple years ago. Yeah. They signed Andy, Andy Dalton. Dalton yeah. It's your job. You're QB1. They just they said he was QB1, right? He is. He is QB1. Yeah. AD14. AD14. And then they draft the quarterback who immediately supplants him. That would be very funny. Yeah. I'm uh, Yeah, I'm excited, though, for draft Draft night is always fun. We'll, we'll be doing uh, – I don't even think we'll have a guest on Friday because we're going to have all the stuff to recap from I, the draft. I really want to see the Raiders get back into Raiders, like, full swing where they draft the fastest wide receiver. Yeah. They maybe even trade up for the guy. The, probably the first wide receiver who will ever wear number one in the NFL. The Raiders yes. spend a fortune on the draft value chart. That's actually something we need to dive into a little bit is the Jimmy Johnson draft value chart because uh, apparently – like 40 years ago, Jimmy Johnson just sat down, had a couple of Captain Morgans and Cokes, and just put numbers next to every pick. And then every coach is like, yeah, I'm just going to go with Jimmy said. Well, I mean, he also ma- made the greatest trade of all time yep. in the draft. So I think that's more why people are like, Jimmy Johnson's a genius. It's just funny that Jimmy Johnson is the guy that we look at as being like the math analytical wizard of the NFL draft. What was the actual trade? I want to look for it. Uh, it was uh, Herschel Walker. Yeah, Herschel Walker. For, I know. I can't remember how many, how many picks they ended up getting, but they it literally was his draft chart built the the dynasty of the Cowboys off that one trade. Yeah. Um, Herschel Walker. I'm pulling it up right now. Hank, did you see your boy Tom Brady uh, weighed in? He essentially wrote a blog about how he doesn't like uh, wide receivers being allowed to wear low numbers. Yeah, and all of his points made a lot of sense. Yeah, what were the points again? Uh, just, just let anyone wear any numbers. Why do linemen have to wear specific numbers? Why can't anyone just wear any numbers? Why even wear numbers at all? Yeah, let's just mm-hmm. give let's just give the teams two different colors. So there were I'm looking it up. The, there were players traded. Obviously, uh, Herschel Walker went uh, to the Vikings, and then in exchange, so the the uh, Cowboys received a couple uh, defensive players from the Vikings as well. In exchange, the Cowboys received Minnesota's first, second, and sixth round pick in 1990. First and second pick in 1991, and then the first, second, and third round pick in 1992. That's fucking insane. Yeah, it's huge. That's that's so Jimmy Johnson. You are a genius. Now you, you going back to his draft board. It really like I'm sure he is a genius for creating it and everyone following it. But really, it should at the bottom of it be like just find someone dumb enough to give you all your picks. Yes, trade a running back for every an pick draft. in the draft. Yeah, yeah for the next that's, three years. That's the new money ball of the NFL. If you can find a team that will just trade everything for a running back that you think will change your people franchise. would freak if this trade happened right now. Yeah, because like even I mean the fact that it was first, it was it was three years consecutive of first and second round picks. That's fucking insane. Well, and, and thanks to the Vikings because they made the Cowboys. What they were in the nineties. Um, what, what coach these days do you think would be most likely to trade their entire draft for a really good running back? I feel like it might be Gruden. He might do it for Derrick Henry, hmm. just because he's just because of his size. I feel like Gruden is a guy that respects mass. Yeah, yeah, Gruden. Um, I mean, Sean McVay would trade every pick for any. Like he'll just trade picks just because they don't exist anymore for yeah. him. I'm trying to think. I actually, I wouldn't. Pete Carroll seems like a guy who's going to try to do a quick fix at some point. Uh huh. Like, I'm just going to trade everything for some sick, I don't know, tight end or maybe Kyle Pitts. Like, yeah. we just got to – because they're, they're in that weird spot. I think it's always a situation where you're trying to placate a star and also rebuild on the fly, and you're like, let me just hit this button and hope it works. You might see a new coach doing something dumb. Yeah. Like the guy in Atlanta. What's his name? Smith. Arthur Smith, who – uh, Thickless cage. We just need to just throw this out there every time. His dad is what? The FedEx? Like the CEO of FedEx, I like, think. Or the founder of FedEx, something like that. If you're asking, does this guy love football? Yeah, he does. Because 
his dad is the CEO of FedEx and he could have just been rich. Exactly. Instead, he's like, I want to grind tape and be an offensive coordinator for a bunch of years and then hope, hopefully become a – hopefully get the dignity of being able to stand on the sidelines as my team collapses and Arthur Blank breathes down my neck. Yes. Like, yeah. that's all he signed up for. Right, right. So he had – it's like running away to join the circus. He rebelled against his family by becoming a football guy instead of becoming Tom Hanks from Castaway. Right, and now he's the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. But, yeah, that guy, since it is season of does this guy love football, I think it's pretty pretty fair to say that he loves football. Yeah, but you could, you could always count on a new coach trying to outsmart the entire rest of the league. Be like, no one's ever thought of this before. And it's usually a mistake that's been made, like, hundreds of times. Right. Zig when not, everyone zags. But yeah. not recently. That's why I still – I mean, I, I it would be so sick if the 49ers just drafted Kyle Pitts. I know. just went double tight end. I have been thinking about and that a lot recently. Face. Yeah, because Kyle Shanahan's the one guy – one of the only guys who can do it, and everyone won't say, wow, that was so stupid. They'll say, oh, my God, what does he see that we don't see? Yeah, they, he, he could have C.J. Beathard play all year next year. Just with cash those two in. tight ends, it'd be sick. Yeah, cash in on the reputation right now. Yep. Um, all right. Other- I wanna, you know what I want to hear? I want to hear Brett Favre's take on – Players wearing different numbers. Dude, Brett Favre, I'm, I'm he, gonna, he loves I'm gonna, putting takes out. There. I'm going to give credit to Brett Favre. I fucking hate his guts. Uh, it probably came through when we had the interview with him. Nothing to do with politics, but because he's a Green Bay Packer. But uh, he has figured out a way to create his own ecosystem of saying something inflammatory and then going on every show to answer to it. Yeah, it's actually genius. I don't think he knows that he's doing that on purpose, but he says something on his podcast. Everyone gets mad, and then the next day it's like Brett Favre with Colin Coward, Brett Favre with Skip Bayless, Brett Favre on like all these shows. So I, it's probably Bus Cook doing all this, but uh, yeah, Brett Favre has figured out a way to just keep him his name just constantly trending. Well, he he keeps in the news cycle because what happens is he'll say something on his podcast, he'll get invited on the show, and then on the show he'll usually like halfway apologize yeah, for what he said, it, yeah, and then TMZ writes an article that's like Brett Favre apologizes for what he said on his podcast. Then he does another podcast and he talks about apologizing for it, says something else dumb, and then he goes on another show to apologize for that. It's actually brilliant. Yeah. He is he is figure he's hacked the system. He knows how to get people talking about Brett Favre. Uh, all right, so other thing we want to talk about: the UFC had an incredible fight on Saturday night. I watched the highlights because I went to sleep. Uh, total dad move, I know. Hand up. Uh, I was still tired from rough and rowdy the night before, but it was so. There's a couple of things that come out of it. One is Jake Paul kind of owns Dana White. A little bit. He a little bit. Now we we got side up with in his face. Dana White. So. So Jake Paul shows up. Everyone says, fuck you, Jake Paul. He makes a whole, like, scene of it. Everyone's talking about him. Daniel Cormier gets in his face. And I got to give, by the way, Billy is here. This is Billy's last week before he goes away and finds himself. I got to give Billy credit because if you saw Jake Paul afterwards said, Daniel Cormier, like, let's sign the deal. You're shorter than me. I'll take you. And I was like, God damn it. Like, so, Billy's right. Like, he that's how it. you that's how you do fights. Do you think that, who do you think would win, Billy? I think Daniel Cormier would win. But, he, but remember, he In can't boxing. he can't lay down on top of Jake Paul. True. I don't know. I think it's also it, the last MMA fighter to fight Jake Paul. Look what happened. Mm-hmm. Ben Askren, who we're gonna disc golf with at some point. Oh, I, can I come? Yes. Well, if you're back from eat, pray, chug. Mm-hmm. It's a sabbatical. <laughs> it's a sabbatical. <laughs> you should write a screenplay. When yeah, you, you get, should. When you get back from about what you learned finding yourself in America. How Billy got his chug back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make a movie out of it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so so the reason why I say Jake Paul kind of owns Dana White a little bit, he got Dana White to talk about him in the post-fight post, post uh, fight press conference, and he points out, which it actually kind of made sense. He's like, "Hey, I'm I've done my third fight, pay per view fight in my career. It's not even like real boxing in the terms of like the heavyweight or, or I mean a, a belt, right?" And he points out that he has made more money than every other UFC fighter before him, except for Khabib and McGregor in their fight. Yeah. So he basically is like, "Dana, why don't you pay your guys so they don't have to come fight me and make their big payday?" And Conor McGregor, by the way, made his big payday. Boxing Floyd Mayweather. Right. Was was McGregor taking a shot at us or was he taking a shot at Jake Paul when he said like the blogger boys that are that are trying to put on fights was, you see that you he was taking a shot better. at Kevin Durant. Okay, got yeah, it. Got yeah. it. Yeah, um I would love I would love to see that fight. I would watch Jake Paul fight anybody at this point because he's done a great job just I want promoting. Wanna, I want to finally see him get his ass kicked by somebody. Right. But he's a great promoter. You know what he should do? He should announce like a mystery fight one night. 
show up and then just be like, I will fight anybody in attendance that wants to fight me consecutively, one after the other, and we'll see how many people in a row I can, I can knock sport. out. Just people in the stands that yeah. want to fight me, I will take all comers. I would watch the fuck out of that. Yes, that would be incredible. Billy would be there, ready to go. I just think that Jake Paul, like, people don't really like him. Everyone's screaming, fuck Jake Paul. But when he when he points out the money disparity, he kind of has Dana White there. He's got because, a good point, yeah. Yeah, guys, don't, like he was like make make the best fight at UFC and pay them a shitload of money because I'm what I'm doing right now is I'm paying whoever fights me a lot of money and I'm getting paid a lot of money and I'm proving that there's an alternative thing out there. So I don't know. I'm sure Dana White Dana White's like a master at these things, so. It could even be a work, and we could see Jake Paul get his ass kicked in an MMA ring. I don't think that Dana does works, though. Yeah. I think when you see – Dana's entire life is a work. True. For the most part. He's worked himself into a shoot of just living. Right. But it worked. I mean, it does – he's made a lot of money doing it. He's got a good business model for Dana White. Yep. The UFC is essentially like a Dana White store. It's like, come here, give money to get into the Dana White store, and then I'll give like a little commission to the salespeople that are out on the floor. Well, the guys, so the who, guys get, who actually absolutely fight. get knocked out. And he's, just... a, he's a good businessman, so I think he, he understands that if he had Jake Paul do something with the UFC, he would make a shitload of money, but he does have that edge to him where he's like, if I dislike somebody enough, I will turn down their money. Yes. Because I don't, yes. I, he doesn't need it. No, he does not need it, but Jake Paul is, I mean, he said he would, he would, box an MMA fighter. He knocked out the MMA fighter. You Whatever you want to say about Ben Askren, who he was a champion, but, like, maybe he's, you know, over the hill and he hit coming off injuries and stuff, but Jake Paul has clearly struck a chord with the MMA. Mm -hmm. He's a master troll, and he's done master troll things. The other uh, two, two things to note, Chris Weidman, that leg injury was so fucking horrific i watched it about a hundred times i'll yeah. just be honest with you because i love watching videos like that he didn't know his leg was fucked up until he tried to stand on like the his shin right because it when you break your shin like that in a kick it just feels like any other shin kick where you hit somebody else's leg where it hurts but then you try to step on it and then it just goes 90 degrees out to the side and i think i think like double leg fractures are i was about to say they're the most painful injury to watch That'll make me cringe instantly. I think like an elbow bending backwards is yeah. worse than that. But I think the tib fib knees, fracture. Knees are pretty bad. Like I always but go back to Willis McGahee. We're kind of desensitized now when it comes to we've seen too many knee injuries. Yeah, that one, that sports. leg injury. And, and uh, uh, the guy who was fighting him, uh, Uriah, how do you say his name? Uriah Hall. Yeah. Uh, first ever fighter to win a fight without having to throw a single punch. Which is, do you, even, do you even take a shower? No, no, I, don't I think, think you so. just I think you just kind of wipe down a little and then go to the club. Yeah, and then and then Masvidal got sent to the shadow realm Dude, himself, big time. That was that punch is, I mean, he got baptized. So he got baptized actually with his own spit because he made him, Usman made him like just spit up every single drop of liquid he had in his in his. Well, mouth. it was his his sweat, and I think his trainer was was dousing him in water as well, which made the effects that much cooler. Yeah, because you could actually see his soul leaving his body. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the the worst part about UFC, which I I think every UFC fan probably agrees, is the the guys obviously are trained to fight till like it's fully called. But there's nothing worse than when a guy gets knocked out, and then you see the natural reaction of go hammer him some more, and the ref doesn't get in there fast enough. This I think it was Herb Dean got in there fast enough, but you always are like, oh my god, is someone gonna die? Somebody like yeah. So I'm such a pussy about that, and then I'll watch Chris Weidman's leg snap like 75 times. The, you'll knock the guy out, and then you like look over your shoulder at the ref to see if the ref is gonna be able to intercept you on your way to right. try to end this guy's right, life. Right. And if the ref doesn't get you, it's like, hey, that's your that's on you. You gotta be willing to step in. I there. think I'm good. I think now that I'm talking through it, leg injuries I'll watch forever. Head injuries make me squeamish. They're tough. Do you think that we'll ever get to a, an instance where somebody gets knocked out, somebody goes in to finish them, the ref jumps on their body, and then the ref gets knocked out by the hammer fist that's coming in? <laughs> yeah. I mean, once we get to, like, UFC 1000, there's so many things happen. Yeah. Why not? Uh, Hank, were you going to say something? I was going to say the even crazier thing about the leg injury was that the, the very, like, fight before, it was basically consecutive kicks. The guy basically broke his nerve on his leg from yep. a kick, and the guy couldn't stand up. The next fight happens, starts leg injury. So yeah. it's just like two freak leg and, injuries and like right 
right back to back. And did you see the uh, consecutive kicks? Canada from uh, the Magic broke his ankle tonight, and there was like he came Wait, down. What? The the guy on, oh, on the oh. Magic. I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Is that K- how you Kenyatta? Can, can you pronounce it for me, Jake? I gotta look it up. Okay. Uh, he came down, broke his ankle, and there was like it was bleeding instantly. Oh, yeah, it was bad. So this is a bad. Bad we Dwight, listen, Dwight Howard, Lord carry him now. Yeah, everyone right now, just do yourself a favor and uh just just take a second out of your morning and be like, Thank thank you God for my legs that I didn't have them snap in a UFC fight or you, you know what big uh break in a NBA game. I would say that the word hero gets thrown around a lot, but you are somewhat heroic for forcing yourself to watch those injuries. Yeah. Because you're no, I love watching you're them. you're reminding yourself uh-huh. Of what these guys put on the line yeah. for entertainment, that'll be your cross to bear. Yeah, no, I, I, I'll hand up. I'm, I'm a sicko like this, but, uh, I just, I don't know. I, I could watch those injuries over and over. It's just crazy to watch. Like, Chris Weidman's, he like his bones didn't exist. He was like Gumby. Yeah, his leg exploded. The it one, was crazy. the one injury I can't watch on replay is the Johnny Knox, the Bears, when he, uh, when he got his back bent backwards. Oh yeah, and like the back of his head touched the back of his heels. Yeah, I can watch that. Kennedy. Kennedy, Kennedy. Uh, I could watch that for sure. Is there any injury you can't watch? Uh, what about when just Dar- head injuries are really the ones that I just can't. Those ones I like whenever. So in November you mute Darren Ravel when he's yes. doing the John F. <laughs> yes. Okay. What was the who who was like basically convulsing in the, uh, Texans? Who was it? Was it Hoyer? No. Who who got hit so hard? Oh no, it was T.J. Yates to hell, like two years ago. He got hit so hard. It was he was, to hell, he was yeah. convulsing. Like that shit will fuck me up. I can't watch that. When they go into the fencing reflex and put their hands yes, out, and that it, that fucks yeah, oh, me up. Oh, the Anquan Bolden one uh, from way back in yes. the day, where he got his face broken. Yes, and then he came yes. back and played like two weeks later. Yes, but any type of ankle, shoulder. Uh, Tom Savage. Tom Savage. Mm. That was it. Tom Absolute Savage. I love uh, finger dislocation <laughs> videos. Yeah. Because the guy just looks at his finger. Yeah, it's And it, lo- it looks bad, uh-huh. and then they go to the sidelines, and they just pop it back into place. Yeah. I actually – I should have – Billy, when you come back and uh, start actually doing your job, I'll have you – um, make me a compilation of all the injury videos that I like to watch. And maybe throw in a puke video, too, and then I'll tweet it. Jesus. What? <laughs> That's – I'll do it. No, I know. I'm. T- I'm <laughs> – listen – I'm admitting it's fucked up. Mm. Like, I'm saying it's fucked up. Are you the guy that, like, finds a new injury video and calls the boys over? It's like, you guys got to watch this. I do. If the, if I see a really bad injury, like, in real time, I'll definitely be like, yo, did you see that shit? That was crazy. They should make the shin kicks illegal. You make think them so? Wear shin guards like they do in other MMA sports. Really? Yeah. Because, like, there's... Is it is it like uh, the maple bats are breaking more often or people's shins starting to shatter more often? Yeah. Really? Exactly. Is that because, like, do you think people are skipping leg day more often? Yeah, what's no, going on I think there? Literally, guys are just kicking so hard the shin can't evolve fast enough. Ah, ah. got it. Okay, but, that's interesting. Now, is there a way to train your shins to be more resilient? Like, if I woke up every morning when I was between the age of, like... 10 and 17 and just hit myself in the shins with like a stick from a tree. I think you just accidentally that, hit the coffee table every morning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, which, which I do. Right. So are my shins over calcified? Probably. Where I could probably fight MMA. No sweat. Wolverine. Do you think someone could ever do that where they get metal shin guards in their body? Yeah. If and like implants like Wolverine. How would, how would they be able to stop that? I guess they uh, couldn't. With, uh, well, with I guess the RNA f- technology that we have with CRISPR. They'd figure it out as soon as they started just breaking everyone's legs with so, one kick. So what I'm hearing, in order to make your body super tough and over-calcified, when you're like 11 years old, you just climb into the dryer and press start, mm-hmm. and then you just get bumps all over your body, and then you're super tough when you get out. Correct. The human body craves contact. That was Crazy. a yabo for the Dodgers. Great. Uh, the Dodgers and the Padres have an awesome rivalry now. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Trevor Bauer. I don't know why people are surprised with Trevor Bauer's response to Fernando Tatis Jr. being like, yeah, I'm actually happy that he, like, you know, mocked me. And people and pitchers should stop getting upset at when people hit, you know, home runs off of them. I That's exactly what I expected out of Trevor Bauer. Trevor Bauer's a troll, but he I never got the impression that he wouldn't be cool with being trolled back. Right. He's a, he's a really good message board user, and he respects game when somebody else is able to troll. He's not the guy that's going to call for the mods. Yeah, he doesn't, he, somebody, I don't think he's getting triggered. No, right. he's not. He's not calling for the mods at all in this one. He is – I mean, he got owned. 
Yes. That's for, and he'll he'll be like, I did get owned. He, all right, so here's his exact quote, which I loved. I thought this was great. He said when he was asked about Fernando Tatis Jr., uh, he mocked him by showing one eye. Trevor Bauer famously said that sometimes he gets bored, so he only pitches with one eye. Uh, he said, I like it. Pitchers who have, who have that done to them and react by throwing at people or getting upset and hitting people or whatever, I think it's pretty soft. If you give up a homer, a guy should celebrate it. It's hard to hit in the big leagues. So I'm all for it, and I think it's important that the game moves in that direction. We stop throwing at people because they celebrated having some success on the field. I fucking yep. love that response. But then he, uh, he went back and he found a clip of him before he hit the home run, and you can see Tatis looking down. And stealing a sign from the catcher. Oh. So now Bauer's mad about that. He's like, oh. he's like, okay, this goes beyond our little back and forth. Which, by the way, is it illegal to look down at a catcher? That is... I don't uh, think it's illegal. I think that... Uh, yeah, I think that's I just, think it's Bush League. Right. I don't think it's illegal either. I think that's just something that happens. I think you. I think that's... You, you just let it happen. No? Yeah, the, the catcher, they should have better signs. Right, yeah. Like, if you're getting if your you're sign stolen, that, it's like getting your sign stolen from second base. Right. Like, it's part of the game. They should contact. That's what happened? He looked at second base? And the no, guy no, 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 no. That was, that's, this that's this illegal. Was, I don't even think the example. This is a guy on Twitter, like, really, really reaching. Yeah. He looked down, and then the catcher looked up at him. But if the catcher was really, like, nervous that Tati stole his signs, he could have just called the timeout, or he could have just redone right. the signs. Like, right. he, it wasn't that serious. I have yes, he is allowed. Usually the catcher waits for the batter to set up before flashing. If the batter is looking for an advantage, it will definitely be obvious and is frowned upon like cheating. Yeah, it's frowned upon. So if right. you have yeah, a guy on illegal. second base, we lay the signs, look- that's illegal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, now, no, like, that's Bush League. I th- no, I think it's Bush League to look at the catcher. I don't think the guy on oh, second no, I think base it's, I think it's flip. can relay him. I think, it's Bush, I think it's Bush League to have a guy relaying him. But it's illegal to look. I didn't realize he was actually looking at the catcher. It it really. I think it was this glimpse. person was reaching. Yeah, there. Okay. Were, so it, John Boy. I, I actually want to take back. I don't know who it was. <laughs> I'm but just what I said John about makes good Trevor videos. Bauer because Trevor Bauer he first said yeah he's the best hitter in baseball. He first said yeah, yeah I got owned, but then he found this and he did the I'm not owned I'm not owned ah, as he shrank into a corn cob. Got bottom. it. Got so it. I think uh, you know what Bauer is probably going to do. He's probably going to like hit up the Crips. Or the Bloods in LA and be like, hey, can you guys work with my catcher and give me new signs? That would be a big time Trevor Bauer thing to do, wouldn't it? Like, that as, was as like a, a, a that troll? was a rated R Rick Riley joke. No, I'm no, I'm actually not joking. I'm, I actually, no, I know. I think that I could see Trevor Bauer doing something like that. He's uh, he they he'll definitely do something with like weird signs or like blinking or something. But he I. I just love this for baseball. I think Trevor Bauer, this has been our, my point forever, is that Trevor Bauer, I know people hate him, but he gets people talking. It kind of goes back to, this is kind of the troll episode. Jake Paul is the same way. Like, I don't like Jake Paul, but he gets the conversation going that Dana White should pay his his fighters more. Mm-hmm. I don't really like Trevor Bauer, but he gets people, actually, I kind of like Trevor Bauer, but he gets people talking and he gets people people's eyeballs onto the screen and people talking about baseball, and that's good for the game. Yeah, there was also Fernando Tatis Jr. hitting two dingers was it the same day? He that hit five and two, five and three games. But he hit two in the same game on the same day that his dad, dad yes. hit two grand slams in the same game against the Dodgers. I think yeah. both against pitchers wearing the same number. This was just a stat that that Bob Costas he saw this. Tim Kirchin was yeah. This Bo- is Kirchin. Kirchin just went crazy. Bob Costas gets pink eye from shoving his face so far up the ass. That stat. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that's just that's baseball, the quirkiest game out there. You just love it. That's why the journalists love it. Uh, also, we're entering a golden age of Suns in Major League Baseball. Yeah. Just Suns everywhere. And just look at the Blue Jays. Yeah, Blue Jays. The entire Blue Jays roster. Did you see what happened with Bo Bichette the other day? No. His homer at Oh, Fenway. yes. That was cool. He, Bo Bichette hit a homer at, that landed in front of the gym. The building. That, the yeah. building that his dad and his mom met. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. That is, that is crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. That's wild. It's fucking, it is wild. It is wild. <laughs> that's no, that's wild. Say it. That, that is, wild. is wild. That's for sure wild. Yeah. And only, like, I don't know, f- what is it, 500? No, probably like 300 miles uh, west, Jim Beheim was probably. Both in the northeast region. Not, mm-hmm. I don't think, I don't think it was, a gym, was alive by the there by then. It was a gym, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He wasn't alive then, was he? Buddy? Mm-hmm. In the nineties, no. Well, it's well, crazy. Shit. maybe well, late nineties. What's crazy? Yeah. That's gonna fuck me up, by the way, for a long time. That I'm gonna think like a 21 year old was born in 1992.
Like I am yeah, still yeah. not. Yeah. Like I, I'm not ready for that. Two thousands. Right. Yeah, exactly. To, yeah. It's like you're born in two thousand, returning twenty one. Yeah. There's That's, no one in college next. Like college basketball won't have anyone who's born before nineteen ninety eight. Well, well, no, Bohannon, Wisconsin, probably. Well, yeah, Wisconsin also. Yeah. Well, Brad Davidson was born in 1985. Davison and yeah. Bohannon will yeah. be there until the end of time. But, yeah, that's going to mess me What's up. What's crazy is that Buddy Beheim right now plays in the same gym that his dad and his mom uh, were married in. Whoa. That's wild. Yeah. F- straight up wild. It is wild. <laughs> straight up wild. Um, all right. Anything else before Kevin Durant is back? I, I, had, a t- I had a thought today. I'm just excited for... The NBA playoffs, because maybe it's because of last year with the bubble, but just to see some new courts in action. Like, the Nets are going to play probably till the Eastern Conference Final or maybe in the finals, and we haven't seen that yeah. in a really long time. Yeah. So, like, I'm a big fan of just different courts. Yeah, I like courts, too. I saw Hank expose himself as a casual today and was like, ooh, this Charlotte court is nasty. Oh, It's, it's been nasty, It's Hank. been awesome. Nasty in a good way? No, gross. Nas- nasty and it. gross I way. love it. I love their jerseys, too. Their jerseys are nice. I just don't like the, I don't know. I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Wait, how I'm many? I'm gonna look at it again because I think I might. I said I, I said it was. I said it was. Nasty. I said it was revolting, and people were like, "That's not what re- revolting means." How many games? How many Hornets games in their entirety do you think Michael Jordan's watched this year? Probably a few. Probably like ten. Yeah, they're actually pretty good. It'd be they funny. Have, they have a solid. They have a solid team. It'd be funny if they got to the playoffs and Michael Jordan like he signed up for Twitter on the night the playoffs started. And he's like, "This court is gross." <laughs> it is. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta. I. They f- oh, fuck. Is that I don't computer? remember. Yeah, I think it is. You over here? No, that's not mine. Over here. That's your computer. The co- old Hornets court had a sick like the honeycomb pattern. No, they had a. Uh, they had they had one. I don't know if it was a honeycomb. They had one that looked like they were a mid tier like college basketball team I, back in like the late nineties. That one was sick. I'm in the minority on this one, but I like the Memphis Tigers court. The one that's oh, doing, no, that's too much doing so on. much. Yeah. We're... Okay. I can't. I'm looking at the Hornets court right now. I can't remember. I think I. Mm, I think I like it. I think I like it. I think I like it. Revolting. I, what I don't Hank. like. What I don't like is when the court. As long as there's some real wood on the court, I can deal with it. Uh huh. It's the courts that do, like the paint and inside the three point mark is like let's say blue and then outside of that is like red yeah that's that's too much for me. unless it's like a, a an outdoor basketball court that's got the green inside the key and the red outside or vice versa i can yeah. live with that but um yeah the uh, the horns court revolt paint the should or- be the only thing that's painted actually the oregon you know court is the worst court of all oregon time. courts that's tough. unnecessary paint it's a waste of paint I, yeah but you'd probably think a different way if if you had won the game against the Hornets. no i said it celtics lost turn the game on it was like psh- I'm revolted. I'm <laughs> revolted. Oh, nice. All right. So I actually, that was a good test because we have so many takes out there all the time that sometimes you accidentally just like go against yourself. Steven you don't A yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just found it. I said the court in Charlotte is low key fire. So fuck yeah. I stayed consistent. I looked hard enough. I stayed consistent. I like it. So I'm with I guess we disagree. Yeah. I think it's low key fire as of January 22nd. Low key fire. Um, and the Oregon court is the worst court of all time. I hate that. It court. looks like it's warped. Every time I see that court, I get fucking so mad. Looks the like net, I mean, you mentioned the Nets one. The Nets one's pretty over. bad too. It doesn't look like a basketball court. Yeah, well, it's a hot. It's got arena. like the weird off off color. Coloring. No, see, I like the Nets court because it makes it reminds me of. Um, now we're just talking courts, yeah. boys. <laughs> 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 We just francesed ourselves into just talking courts. Uh, I I like the Nets court because it reminds me of uh, Eastern Michigan's football field, the gray and the the all gray. Yeah, but that's like uh-huh. funny for the action. I this know. is fucking I don't know NBA I basketball. I kind of like it. It makes me kind of do a double take. Like is my is my TV fucked up? I so, think I, I think a, a basketball court we said would be. If you were to be a, a tree that got cut down, you either want to be a, an NCAA bracket yep. or a basketball court. Yep. Money. Would be the coolest thing to go back as. Yep. Money. Maybe Fernando Tatis's bat. Yeah. That would be pretty sick, too. Money? Why? They just print new money all the time. Yeah, but old money is the good money. Oh, you're talking old, old yeah. money. Yeah. Okay. You're talking about the old, like, $20. How many? How, is there a $500 bill? No. I think so. Whitney Houston. How, what is the dot? 
There's is there a thousand dollar yeah, bill? They is. they printed up. Why some doesn't big anyone ever have thousand dollar bills? Who's on it? I think it was just it was made exclusively for cocaine use. Can you find that for us? Yeah. What's there the was a hundred thousand dollar bill. During I still the Great think Depression. one of my one of my uh, dumbest slash maybe most genius ideas is to counterfeit two dollar bills because no one actually knows what they look like. And no one would ever think you'd counterfeit a $2 bill. Mm-hmm. So if you just counterfeited all the $2 bills, I think you'd be able to... When you see a $2 bill, you already think it's counterfeit just because it's so rare. Look, there you go, Billy. You just carry a $2 bill around. Yeah, I think it's lucky. Yeah. I'm not sure. This might be fake. Hank, I no remember idea. when I, I tried to pitch that to Mark Cuban and I asked you to go into the bank to get me a $2 bill and you came back and you're like, they don't have any. Yeah, I was, <laughs> like on, I was just, on my Billy shit. Yeah, Dude, yeah, that was your Billy shit. You, you just can't do it in Clemson because Clemson has that weird thing where their fans, they bring $2 bills with them wherever they go so that they can demonstrate the impact of the Clemson fans traveling to different college towns oh, because they so spend lame. so many $2 bills. Oh, that's so – that's <laughs> terrible. Uh, all right, Bill, Jake, did you find it? I'm not seeing a date, so I don't want to report it. Okay, that's fine. Um, don't report it. Just the it. CPI and, yeah. What? What is it? it says the CPI was at an estimated 36.8 back in 1969. As of December 2019, the U.S. CPI sat at over 256, meaning a $1,000 bill will be the equivalent of a relatively modest $153 bill. Wait, what? I don't know. What does that mean? What did you just that, say? That's. I just want to know if there's a $1,000 bill out there. There is. It was in a Friends episode. There we go, Billy. The hundred nice. th- or the $1,000 bill has Grover Cleveland on it. Okay. It initially had Hamilton, but then they were like, hey, it might be confusing to have the same president on two different bills. Someone who works at a bank, let us know about what type of bills you got working for you. Don't tell us where your bank is, but just let us know. How many people are, are going to tweet at us being like, yo, Hamilton wasn't president? A Pro- lot. Probably a lot. A lot, yeah, but he was a sick rapper. Uh, ben all Franklin right. was, though. Let's go to Who's Back of the Week. Who's Back of the Week brought to you by Cash App. Speaking of money. Go download it right now. You don't even need dollar bills anymore, but the Cash App is there. The Cash App, you can buy uh, Bitcoin. Another reason why you don't need uh, dollar bills, guess what? They make a $50,000 Bitcoin. That's what it's at right now. Uh, You can invest in the stock market. You can do it all with the Cash App. You don't need to have cash in your hand. You can link it directly to your bank account. It's super easy to use. Download the Cash App. Enter the referral code BARSTOOL. You get $10 for free, $10 to ASPCA. And when you download that Cash App, you get both those. And you also get the satisfaction that you help the podcast. So download the Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today. Hank, who's back of the week? Uh, Madison Bumgarner. Yeah. yeah. Threw a no-hitter today. So good no, for him. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, he didn't, Hank. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. Nah. No, it was a seven-inning game. Mm-hmm. Not a no-hitter. Doesn't count as a no-hitter. Yes, I, it does. Because of Rob Manfraud. I really – they should just let him keep going. Yes. And if and if he throws if, – if someone gets a hit off him – in the middle of the eighth inning, they just end the game. Wait, that's not a no hitter. It's not a no hitter. I mean, it's not. It's seven inning no hitter. But they should. What I'm saying is, yeah, but they don't they sh- give you no hitters if the game gets canceled in like seven no, innings? No, I don't know no, that. Don't but no, so. it's it's not a no hitter. What he should have done, if he w- truly had presence of mind, he should have just walked a bunch of players until the Braves scored five runs, taken the game to extra innings, got it to nine, and then it counts as if if a Double header game goes to nine innings. It does count as no hitter if you complete that. Mm. Or he should have had his catcher drop a bunch of third strikes so that he could get twenty seven outs. More strikeouts. Yeah, yeah. twenty seven outs with uh, no hitter. Yeah, I I really do think. Or they his sh- next two innings should count. Like it should be a fun little quirk in baseball. If they're going to do the seven inning double headers, it should be if a player has a no hitter or a perfect game. The game goes till nine innings, or when a fir- when a hit happens, mm-hmm. and then if a hit happens, they just end the game right away, right then. I agree with that. So fix it. How about the Braves though? Today they got they got no hitted, asterisked, and then I think they had like a one hitter or a two hitter. Yeah, not a good day game. for the Braves. Not a good day for the Braves. Good to see. Madison the one hitter over. counts. What MLB recognizes the one hitter, but, but not, not a no hitter. hitter. What do you mean they I, ain't recognize love Major League Baseball? That's just. They just say that it like it goes, goes down in the record books as a one hitter, but not a no hitter. So that ball from the no from the no hitter asterisk, does that ball go to Cooperstown? Probably not, because it's not a no hitter. I wonder. I need someone. I'm now asking a lot of the AWLs. We need to track down. Tell us all the money that is. By the out way, there. I found the money. No, 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 let them do it. An assignment. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, are there more one hitters than t- 
are there less one hitters than no hitters? I think probably yeah. Someone Dude, find because, that for me because if you're like Nolan Ryan and you know that you have a, a no hitter and you're in a situation where you've got like a three one count, you're just going to walk the guy as opposed to throwing a pitch that he might hit. What do you think, Hank? got to be more science math one hitters yeah no it's complete game one hitters yeah there's more no no for chance. sure 100 percent. i don't know man no chance i i, I loser I, has to kill a deputant okay a, a deputant deal yeah. bring it back all right. all right it's it's probably like double or triple it's got to be i'm not a math guy but double or triple. I'm, I'm complete I'm game one on this hitters one. versus complete game no hitters there's double complete game one hitters there's more. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'll bet that there's more. Okay. All right. Well, someone find that stat for us. Uh, PFT. Who's your who's back? Uh, my who's back of the week is. Well, I was going to have Roger Goodell hugging people, but we already addressed that. So I'll go to my backup. Novelty drinks. Mm. Novelty drinks are back big time. Uh, I was at a bar the other day, not to brag, and they had a sick novelty drink. And I think this summer I'm going to soup. If there's a novelty drink that's on the menu, I'm going to order it every single time. I'm talking like a punch bowl style thing or a margarita. That's got a beer upside down in it. I, I don't know what it is, but I can't not get the novelty thing that they only serve at that location. It's like asking the waiter or the waitress, like what's, what's your favorite thing on the menu? Yeah. You've got to order it. By the way, it's a, it's a sick flex to be like, Hey, what do you recommend? The steak? Or the fish, and then the server will be like, the steak's really good, and then you go, perfect, I'll have the fish. Yeah, I like right doing, in their face. I like doing that, but I will order the novelty drink every single time that it's available, that's an option. I'm just, I, I'm obsessed with them. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Always have a lot of sugar. Yeah. Always. You just feel like you're accomplishing something. Yeah. Yeah, it was when they bring out the, um, the big-ass margarita with a bunch of bottles of beer in it and yeah. shit. It's fucking cool. Just a cool thing to do. Uh, we should make Coors Light make a mo- novelty drink. Yes. That would be sick. Colorado Kool-Aid. You already Kool-Aid. have it? It should, it should be the- a blue snow cone. Ooh. Or the Colorado Kool-Aid. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. just, it's a, it's a Coors, it's a Coors Light that just has like a little bit of red food coloring. Mm, perfect. Perfect. Um, all right. My who's back of the week is parenting because Chad Ochocinco had uh, one of the uh, funniest exchanges with his daughter that I don't even think he realized. I don't know. It's hard to figure out with him because he's a very funny guy, but I think he was dead serious. So he posted a screenshot of his conversation with his daughter and uh, his daughter said, uh, daddy. And he said, yes, ma'am. He, she said, let me know when you go to token my mammy to get more shoes. I'm going to come with you because I want to get these Yeezys that, uh, that they have. And he said, you got to get a job. I worked at McDonald's by Edison to attain extra stuff I wanted in high school. And she essentially says, when I finish school, I'm getting one, the old uh, Billy football answer. And uh, how could I get a job when I have to do uh, high school and track and all these things? And Chad Ochocinco replied, I caught the bus to school, then went to football practice, caught the bus to McDonald's for a six-hour shift, all while maintaining a 2.2 GPA (laughs) and being a star athlete. (laughs) So, Chad, well, I don't know if he was joking or not, uh-huh. but that is such a hilarious flex to be like, look how hard I worked, and I fucking rocked nothing but, like, C's. I think it's even more impressive that he still remembers what his GPA was. Well, 2.2. If it 2. was, a, 2. If it was yeah. a 2.2. Yeah. Like, if it's anything below a 3, like, you could ask me what I got in college. I'd be like, I, somewhere between a 2.5 and a 3.5. Someone someone replied uh, very funny on Twitter because everyone was roasting him. 2.2 2. 2 GPA was trending on Twitter, and... Uh, Someone was like, "Dude, you don't maintain a 2.2 GPA. That's sure not no, no you, the, you, like if you're trying to stay no el- if you're trying to stay eligible for <laughs> yeah, sports. That's, that's a fucking grind. <laughs> that's, that is a grind. Yeah, that's how he knows what his GPA was to stay above 2.2. Oh man, was 2.2 the limit? You think, or it was it 2.0? Two. Depends two. on the district. Two, two probably is the limit. I think no, because I think 2.2 is a C minus, so he has to just stay above a D. Wouldn't two be a C? Yeah, one two, would be a D. Two's a C. Yeah. It depends on the system. Well, isn't it? Four's four an A, sure three's a B, two's a C, one's a D, zero's an F. But there's stuff like you like have to be above a, a C. APs and four point fives and stuff. I don't think, I don't think, think that Chad, Chad was, was. Yeah, if he was, was if he was main no, but that affects the GPA limit. But I'm pretty sure two's a C. Yeah, but it's more like if you get AP, you can have a four point five. Isn't it? Isn't two a C? Yeah. Or maybe two. It depends on the system. Two is a C. 
Or is it a C minus? Now I'm starting. Now Billy's getting in my head. In the standard, it's two is a C. Okay. Yeah. Three is a B, that four is an A. Was, uh, yeah. What was your Yikes. GPA? I got a little nervous there. Uh, in high school? Yeah. I think I had a three, four, five in high school. 2.2. Man, maintain that. She's shit. getting. I had a two point three, and that was that was some. There was some maintenance that was necessary. <laughs> 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 you, had to, you had to go out and cut the grass every now and then. And yeah, make sure you, know. you get that two point two. Yeah. Uh, all right, <laughs> Billy. What's your who's back? My who's back of the week is J Rod. Jennifer oh. Lopez and A Rod were seen going out to dinner in L A. We you know mourned their breakup, but love. Whoa, maybe there's a chance. No, I think they're just being friends. Yeah. 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 Shout out A-Rod who got vaccinated. No big deal. Um, my other who's back is Monster Trucks. DMX's funeral had a sick monster truck. And yep. in a very somber moment, it was nice to see that DMX's rough riders, they were still riding. It was cool as hell. So cool. Shout uh, out my, my, my son who was probably one of the biggest DMX fans out there because there was so much traffic in Brooklyn yesterday that he puked all over himself in the car because it was stop and go. So that was kind of like a one last like – you know, like for for DMX, uh-huh. he, poured, <laughs> he poured one out for him. Yeah, he was just like this. This sucks. We're in the car. I just missed DMX. I'm gonna puke <laughs> all over myself real quick. A uh, remote draft live streams are back. Are you just piling this on because you're trying to just, just a little? Okay, all right, keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Remote drafts. Billy's really stat okay. compiling now. No. He's stat padding. Yeah, <laughs> this is garbage time. This is the fourth quarter of his, <laughs> take of his career. And he's just like, no, oh, I'm trying to get as many who's back. I have up more. There as I have more. Uh, Holy yeah, shit. so like, we, I know not everything's going to be a uh, remote like it was last year, but like, remember like moments like the CD Lamb phone taking back the Vrabel household was just ridiculous, and uh, <laughs> Belichick had a dog, dog picking yeah. people. Dog All right, jam. next one. Keep my going. next I one is identity. Padding. This is fucking awesome. Identity Billy. theft. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> There's so a drug rough. dealer in England who's pretend- pretending to be Conor McGregor and selling drugs, being like, I'm Conor McGregor, I'm actually selling drugs. And trying the to convince The best part people- about this is that Billy's going to fucking, when he's like, see all I've done, he's going to be like, I average 1.75 who's back of the weeks a week. And it's like, then you, you break it down, uh-huh. his game log, he had 15 in his last episode <laughs> before his break. All right, um, keep going. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Oh, come on. You have one more. Oh. Full counts? Full crowds. Full, full crowds. Crowd. Full crowds. Full crowds. Okay. Well, I yeah, fan- UFC. No, I said fans were back the other week. Yeah. So that so was your old who's back is back. Yeah. Fans. Double count it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fans, similar sounding words. Yeah. yeah. That, it was sick that the UFC fight, like seeing all those fans. And also, soccer had some fans. Knockouts are way cooler when there are fans there. If yeah. there's if there's no fans yes. during a knockout, it, you kind of feel like a pervert watching it. Yeah, but it's if there's little... other people, if you can see other people getting excited about violence, you're like, okay, I feel good about yes. this. Yes, everyone <laughs> raging together. Yeah. You guys think Joe Rogan does the reactions now for on purpose, or do you think he's genuinely uh, reacting? No, I think he's, his brain is just no. the new tropics are just firing at an insanely fast rate. As someone who's who's been in the ring ringside what on the, was on the, the call big cat. what was the was two he which did, one was the one that was most viral i think the the thug rose one yeah. okay but the weidman kick definitely deserved it like when he tried to i, step I don't think on i think the two i think the two reactions knockouts were the, the ro- yeah. thug rose and then, then the, maybe the he's trying to mm-hmm. ham it the up the masvidal one he actually once commented on like he understands the importance of video and going viral so that i think he like i think he's definitely but I, so I also it. think that that's just Joe Rogan being stoked in his nat- natural environment. True. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's like that and a guest talking about zombie deer disease. We mm-hmm. get the exact same facial reaction yes, out of him. Yes, absolutely. Or how many guns he's stockpiled and how much bison meat he's been eating. That would, <laughs> it's the same level of stoke. Do you think that eventually we'll get to a point where Joe Rogan buys his own bison and he just eats it raw while it's still alive. Uh-huh. That's like the ultimate amount of protein. Just nibbles off of it? Yeah, just like, because first you have to get close enough to bite it, mm-hmm. and then you have to get away, and it's raw, and the meat probably still has, since it's still alive, it's probably even faster twitching. Yeah, that's true. We'll get there. Um, all right, let's get to our interview. we got Todd McShay. We're going to talk some draft with Todd McShay. Some actually awesome anecdotes about a couple of the guys, uh, Devontae Smith and uh, Trey Lance. Uh, before we do that... A quick word from our friends at Blue Nile. Whether you're customizing an engagement ring 
or designing diamond stud earrings at BlueNile.com. You're in control. Build a more brilliant piece at a price you won't find at a traditional jeweler. Uh, check them out, Blue Nile. Uh, there's also, you know, we got a bunch of different holidays coming up. If you want to get jewelry for maybe Mother's Day or the engagement. Hank, have you checked out Blue Nile? No, I haven't. Okay, well, Blue Nile is the original online jeweler. Since 1999, they've helped millions of couples create their perfect engagement ring. Blue Nile is committed to ensuring that the highest ethical standards are observed when sourcing diamonds and jewelry. Each diamond is GIA graded, which allows you to view the unique qualities, carat weight, color, or cut, and be confident of the quality you are buying. Blue Nile is different from their competitors. They don't mark up to mark down, meaning BlueNile.com's everyday prices are competitive to other online retailers' sale prices. Expert advice 24-7, legendary service with 30-day returns. When you commit to a piece, so does Blue Nile. Guaranteed service and a repair for life. Diamond price guarantee. Contact Blue Nile to compare a competitor's diamond against one of ours. In most cases, uh, Blue Nile can meet or beat their price. So check it out. Make the moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And part of my take listeners get five, $50 off 500 this podcast exclusive offer includes engagement. Use code PMT. That's code PMT. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop uh, stress free and find your forever piece. Go to bluenile.com today. Go to bluenile.com today. Use that code PMT. $50 off, $500. So check them out, bluenile.com. Use code PMT. All right, here he is. Todd McShay. Okay, we now welcome on uh, a very special guest. He's a recurring guest, friend of the program. Uh, it is Todd McShay. You're going to see him on draft night on Thursday night. We're finally here, draft week. Todd, thank you for joining us. I, I was just reading your latest mock draft. Is there – I don't know the answer to this, and I feel like a fool. Is there a, one final one that's coming out right before the draft? Do we still have one more iteration? Yeah, thank, thank goodness. Although, you know, sometimes the the second or third one's better than the fifth and the last one. So, but uh, yeah, we do, Mel and I do one the night before the draft. So Wednesday night we'll do it and it'll, uh, it'll be on .com, ESPN.com on, on Thursday. Okay, great. And do you get credit? Like if I were you, I would just take credit for any right answers I had through the five or six mock drafts I did. Do you do that? I'd love to, but no one, you know, no one seems to care. But I mean, it's amazing this year, especially with with teams not being able to meet face to face with a lot of these prospects. Like I, I talked to three general managers today, one head coach and one uh, director of player personnel, I think is his title. And it's amazing just listening to all the, the scoop and the buzz that they're getting and how different it is from one team to the next, you know? Yeah. I mean, I could, I could go through 15 different scenarios just in the top 10 alone in terms of what, what everyone's hearing. We know Trevor Lawrence is going number one overall. We, I know for a fact Zach Wilson is going number two overall to the Jets. After that, it's it's going to get real interesting. Yes. Yeah, so you have Mac Jones going number 3 to the 49ers. That's the one that it, it feels like the longer Mac Jones has gone without playing football, the higher he's climbed up the draft rankings here. Is there do you think that that's kind of what Kyle Shanahan's look at? You think he traded up to get Mac Jones or is it a possibility that that's a smoke screen? Are you being smoke screened right now? <laughs> I'm always worried about it. But um but what I'm told is, and from, from people that I really trust in the league, is that the personnel department would, would like to take Trey Lance from North Dakota State, but Kyle Shanahan, the head coach, wants to take Mac Jones. Hmm. So how do, you, how do you pick, if you're a personnel department and you've got a head coach who, who's a, a quarterback guru and, and an offensive mind, how do you pick against what he wants? You know, I, I just don't see that happening. So. That's going to be interesting to see if, if they if they wind up going with with Lance, but I do, I would I would bet money on on Mac Jones going three and then four. Everyone thinks that Atlanta's taking a quarterback, and, and who knows, maybe they'll surprise me. But 
I've, I've talked to a, another really reliable source that thinks that they're going to take Kyle Pitts, a tight end from, from Florida. So it could be quarterback, quarterback, quarterback for the first three picks. And then Pitts, the tight end, could come off the board at number four to Atlanta if Atlanta doesn't move out of that number four spot. And if, and if they do take Pitts at four, then the big question is, because you got five quarterbacks, and Lance in this scenario would be available, and, and Justin Fields from Ohio State would be available. And now you're looking down – Miami's not going to take a, a quarterback. Cincinnati, I should say, at, at five is not taking a quarterback. Miami's not. And then you get to uh, Detroit at seven. They're they're not going to. They're going to take a wide receiver or, or a linebacker or Panay Sewell, the Oregon offensive tackle. And then the next team on the board that I'm told that there's a chance could take a quarterback is Carolina at number eight. That could be the big surprise of the first round. Interesting. Is just, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you trade for Sam Darnold. You kind of got your guy. They lost eight games by one score. And, and and talking, you know, to their coaching staff, they everyone I talked to on that staff said if we just had a guy in the fourth quarter, we could have won four or five of those games that we lost. Um, so, why do you bring in another quarterback? But you got Sam Darnold for for just five five million dollars next year and only on a two year deal. So it might be ownership saying, hey, let's make sure that we're covered for the next ten years rather than just worrying about next year. So I, I want to go back to what you just said about Kyle Shanahan, a, a question that popped in my head. How many, mm-hmm. and you don't have to name names, but how many teams in the NFL does the co- the coach have s- kind of de facto final say when it comes to who they're going to draft, more so than the personnel dis- department and maybe even more so than the GM himself? That's a good question. And I, I, not many teams would, would be public about it. I would say less than 10, definitely. Mm-hmm. I mean, Belichick certainly in New England. Right. He runs the whole, the whole show. Um, and, and this is a, this is just case specific, you know, John Lynch and, and that personnel staff, they're going to, they're going to make all the other picks. Right. But Kyle, because he's such an offensive guy, how do you draft a guy that a quarterback, that's not what your head coach wants. Right. You know, I, I think that's kind of where, it kind of the 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 tug and pull is in terms of tr- just figuring out what's best for the organization. So there's, I mean, and, and then you have anytime it's a quarterback, especially in the top ten, ownership is always involved. You got to get you got to get the green light from the owner. So hmm. it's it's always it's always interesting. But I mean, again, like you got the three teams at the top taking quarterbacks, and then you've got Carolina, who the I'm told the owner who's a progressive owner, he's got a, a ton of money, he wants to bring in another quarterback just to make sure that they're set for the next several years. And then after that, at nine, Denver, nobody knows what Denver wants to do. Are, right. are they going to stick with Drew Locke, or are they going to take the quarterback at that spot? And then the the wild card is, is there a team trying to trade up? You know, if Justin Fields falls to, you know, you know if he gets to seven – is there a team like New England? And I don't think it's going to be New England based on, on my sources. I think New England's more likely to trade back than they are to move up. Uh, but could it be Chicago at 20 trying to make a, a big move, trying to go up to get Justin Fields? So that's going to be the most interesting part of the draft, I think, is, is when we get down to the final one or two quarterbacks and you get past Atlanta, is there going to be movement? And we typically see a lot of movement. I, I the the Chicago thing obviously is interesting um, because I do think that they are in a spot and you see it all the time with the front front office and a, a coach they're on borrowed time so really the only way they get out of this is Andy Dalton somehow gets them to the playoffs or they draft a guy who shows a little bit of something at the back half of the season and then they can sell it like that's our guy we got our guy so do you think I I always assume they would just get someone in the second round you think that they could potentially try to trade up if someone falls. I think they they could try to, but they're they're they've been stuck in this middle ground yeah. in in free agency and in the draft. You know, like you're, when you're picking at twenty, you have to give up. You're talking about three ones and and more change to go up to seven, let's say, and get ahead of Carolina to go get a quarterback. And if you have ownership, 
that's not convinced that this is a, this is our GM moving forward, are you going to allow this guy to make a move that's going to, you know, leverage your your organization for the next several years? I that's the that's where I think they're in a tough spot. Yeah. So I I my guess is that we're going to see the quarterbacks come off the board all, all five by nine. I think Carolina is going to be in play. I think Denver could be in play. I don't see another team. Washington at 19 could try to move up, but again, you're giving away so much, and they have a good football team. Um, and it'll be interesting. You know, I, I I don't know how it all lays out, but I do know where all these teams are kind of kind of leaning in terms of where they want to go. But the which team is going to be the one that makes them move up the board? And if you don't get a guy in the first round, as you mentioned. There are three guys that I think are going to be drafted in the second round. Davis Mills from Stanford, who started just 11 games but was a five-star recruit. I think he was the number one recruit coming out of college. And I talked to David Shaw a couple of years ago, and he's like, we'll never have an, another Andrew Luck. But he's the closest thing that we've had since and, and maybe we'll ever have in terms of physical tools. And there are a lot of teams that are intrigued by him. I'm told Washington – Chicago and New England all have interest in him in the second round. Hmm. Then Kellen Mond from Texas A&M, who was a four-year starter, very inconsistent, but extremely talented, big arm, mobile, big physical dude, um, and got better in terms of decision-making and his accuracy this past year. And then Kyle Trask is another guy. I actually heard a rumor today talking to a GM that Tampa Bay could be interested in bringing him in late in the first round huh so you know vegas set it at five and a half and i kind of laughed at that i was like there's no way there's going to be a six quarterback but vegas you know vegas is always smarter than me so yeah um I, yeah <laughs> so i you know may it may be trask is that guy that sneaks into the late first round and it seems like every year we see a guy whether it's 28 29 30 31 32 a team is willing to move out and get good compensation and a team is afraid to, to go to bed that night after the first night of the draft without the quarterback that they really want. Right. Mm-hmm. They start to panic. It was like that one year, was it 2011, where you had Jake Locker and, and all those guys go in a row. So do you think if if all five quarterbacks get taken like in the top 10, top 11, there's besides the Patriots, what would be a team that you would think might panic and and uh, and shock us by moving up to take I don't know either Trask or or uh, you know any of the other guys that you mentioned? Yeah, I, I think those teams I just I just mentioned. I think I think Washington, especially with the love that I'm hearing about you know what what they think Mills can be and how they could develop him. I think New England's intriguing. I mean, what if? I can never get Bill Belichick's draft right, so don't even ask me. But if you spend all this money in the offseason and you bring back Cam Newton on a short-term deal for backup money, basically, at the quarterback position, and you've you've kind of solidified – I know they still have needs, but you've you've solidified tight ends, certainly. You brought in some receivers, some some edge guys. Like, they – they spent more money, I, I believe, and I got to double check this, but I think they spent more money in free agency than any team in the history of the NFL. Yeah, and they took they took advantage of having a ton of cap space in a year where you know uh, the money in the cap went uh, went down in terms of what you could spend. So uh, you're in a spot, a perfect spot to try to go solidify that quarterback position for the next several years, but it, it has not been Bill Belichick's. MO over the last several years. I mean, but why would it be? That's I keep going back and forth on this because if I had Tom Brady for 20 years, I wouldn't want to spend a first round pick on a quarterback. I would want to bring in guys like uh, Jacoby Brissett and, you know, Jarrett Stidham and, and all the other guys that they brought in in the second to fifth round. But, um, but this is the year it seems like they're pressing. Mm-hmm. They're finally. You know, they've had an offseason without the playoffs. They've self-evaluated. They know they they don't have Brady to make up for all the sins that that every other position has had in, on that roster. And so they realize that they've, they've got to get better, and they did it. But now you need a quarterback for your fu- future unless you're just convinced that Cam Newton can be your guy for the next two, three years. Uh-huh. And then the other team, again, is Chicago. So I think Chicago – I think it's Washington 51. I'll double check here. 
I think Washington, yeah, Washington's 51, Chicago's 52. And then if Denver doesn't go quarterback in the first round at nine, they're sitting at 40. So those are the teams that I think are going to be the most likely to, to be the movers on, on, um, on the, in the second round. And then New England as well, picking at 46 in round two. We're going to get back to Todd McShay in a second. Before we do, Coors Light has a special announcement. What do you do when you need a moment to chill? Do you ever always feel like you're on? How do you like to hit the reset button to get ready for what's next? Well, these days, everything is go, go, go. It's nothing but nonstop hustle all the time. Work, friends, family, a million pressing social issues and an expectation to be on 24-7. Sometimes you just need a moment to turn off and hit reset. That's when you reach for Coors Light. It's made to chill. The big announcement is the mountains were extremely blue this weekend. We need to figure out what the bluest blue is and uh, figure out like the optimal blue because sometimes darker blue doesn't always conform with is that mountain bluer? I don't know. I don't know what blue is. I know it when I see it. The mountains were extremely blue this weekend. Perhaps the bluest of all time. Jake did a Pantone check for me. Thank you, Jake. It took you about like five minutes. You're always reliable. And the mountains were indeed blue. It was crisp. It was refreshing. Coors Light is cold lagered, cold filtered, and cold packaged. It's literally made to chill. It's as crisp and refreshing as the Colorado Rockies. Perfect for a moment to unwind. You know what's also refreshing? It's Coors Seltzer. We love Coors Seltzer. We got a big pack right here on the desk. I had a Coors Seltzer at the ball game. Nothing like it for a seam head like me. Do you ever feel like you're always on the go? If you're juggling a million things, well, you need to relax, you need to chill, and Coors Light is literally made for these moments. So get Coors Light and Coors Seltzer delivered straight to your door. You can use Drizzly or Instacart. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado, and Fort Worth, Texas. And now, more Todd McShay. So I, I know that you have Trevor Lawrence as the, you said the best quarterback prospect that you've seen in nearly a, a decade. I don't know if that's a comparison to Andrew Luck. My guess is probably Luck uh, would be the other guy that would be maybe a little bit above him. Yeah, it's the second highest grade I've given to a quarterback since Andrew Luck. I'm not going to ask you if you think he loves football because I feel like that conversation <laughs> has been had. But I will yep. ask you, are you concerned that his hair is too long? Because long-haired quarterbacks don't win Super Bowls. Um, didn't Brady no, win the Super Bowl? No, we looked Bowl through with... it. He lost that year. It's basically, uh, I think oh, Kenny Stabler is like the only one. And he was like a little shaggy. He right. was, I wouldn't call yeah, it long hair. You guys hair. are all over it. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, some I people are talking research. about neck size <laughs> being the key indicator as opposed to hand size. <laughs> I actually think I would not take a quarterback that has hair as long as mine. I think, like, I wouldn't draft myself. I'd be like, who's this dirty hippie? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would never draft you. Um, <laughs> that's, why, that's why you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... <laughs> He's 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 an interesting cat, man. He's he's so down to earth. I mean, think about what he went through this past offseason with the, all the social injustice, taking over the leadership on that as as a white quarterback, right? And, and being the leader of his team and 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 kind of you know just focusing on what was important to his teammates. And and then with COVID, and and he didn't have to play either. He could have opted yeah. out. Yeah. And would have been the number one overall pick, but he came back and he battled and, you know, and, and they, they had another really good run. He's 38 and two as a starter. I've done nine games the last three years as a sideline analyst is I guess what they call me. Um, and I, I stalked him on the sideline. You know, I, I was almost weird. I, he, he probably should have, you know, gone to court to, to get me out of the stadium, but I just wanted to see how he reacted. And he was always so steady. And I love that about him. Now he's, he's, he's going to have to develop from a Clemson offense that, that is not an NFL scheme, if you will. Um, and there's, there's a couple small things that he's going to have to improve upon, but this dude is, is everything you want at the position because he, he has the poise, he has the leadership, and then obviously all the physical tools. It doesn't t take a super scout to figure out that that this guy who's you know six six five and a half, two hundred and fifteen pounds with a, a rifle arm and and the mobility that he has is is physically you know talented enough to be a star in the league. But I just I love the way he carries himself. So so along that line, I, I do love that you are at a lot of these games because I do think that there's something you can pick up from being at a game, especially being on a sideline that you can't pick up on film. Who's the guy that you uh, have 
seen on the sideline and how they interact with their teammates or how locked in they are, or he's just that dude who maybe not doesn't it doesn't show it on the film, but you know that's a guy who like will translate to the NFL. I mean, I see it on the film, but Devontae Smith has been the most fun guy to watch the last two years in college football. There is honestly, I would if anyone who loves football, I I could bring them down on the field and have them stand six feet away from from Devontae Smith and Jalen Waddell and then the year before Henry Ruggs and, and Jerry Judy and to listen to those four they, they there's there's an offensive bench right the offensive linemen sit on the bench the quarterbacks there you know around and then and then some of the other position guys pull up chairs and kind of circle around the coordinator comes in or the offensive line coach comes in but they're always sitting on this back bench and they come off the field and they chirp at each other. I mean, they get in each other's face. And then they go over to, to Steve Sarkeesian, who was the offensive coordinator at Alabama, and, and start yelling at him like, hey, they're, they're, showing, they're showing cover two, but it turns into quarters coverage. And like, their football intelligence and their competitiveness, I've never seen. And I've been doing this for, I don't know, nine years, I think, uh, being on the field. And, and just listening to coaches and players and all, and all that, I have never seen anything like it. And I talked to, to Sark about, about Devontae specifically because, I mean, he, he's what, 170 pounds? Yeah, he's, he's, if le- that. he's so Yeah, he, he's, he's so lean. He doesn't look the part. And I, I, I see what I see on tape. He, I mean, he's silky smooth and he knows how to separate and all that. I was, but I asked Sark, like, what do you what do you see from him in, in practice and in games that you can't actually see on tape? And the thing that he said was, I've never had a receiver in all of my years of coaching. And you think about where he's been, you know, in the NFL, USC, etc. I've never had a receiver come over on the sideline and give me as much or more information than I got from a quarterback in terms of the recall of what he saw, what they're trying to do, how we can leverage it and so on and so forth. So that's what makes him special. Yeah, that's a great answer. And that's also like he's one of those guys that if you watch the game, you're like, how is he not going to be a top 10 pick? And then the size thing dings him, and everyone's like, well, you know, 166 pounds. And But I, I saw this is like – this is the lightest wide receiver class, I think, of all time. All these guys are kind of smaller, and I think that's probably more where the NFL is going in terms of not being able to hit guys the same way. Yeah, and they're all they're all running four twos and four threes, right? And you know whether whether you you can't compare these numbers to what the combine numbers would be because they they're you know you just you don't know. You know, Ohio State. I've 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 been convinced for twenty years of doing this job that they were run a thirty-eight yard forty. Thank That's you, uh, Thank theory. you, Todd. Yes. Todd. Yes. Todd. 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 Thank yes. you. We asked Daniel <laughs> Jeremiah about this last week because it's my oh, theory, it's my theory that some some colleges they shorten up specific section of their practice fields so you know their field turf they're permanently you know marked with the with the yard markers. My theory is that they have a specific section that's less than 40 yards. The, the hashes are a little bit closer together, or the yard markers are a little bit closer together, just so that when they do a pro day, uh, they can get away with running like a 38-yard <laughs> dash instead of a 41. And, and Daniel Jeremiah was like, no, because the scouts measure it before yeah, every run. Yeah, they do. They, 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 they bring out the tape and they measure it. I, I only say it jokingly. But it, what is different, though, is – and you see it at the Combine, too – you know, have you ever watched the NFL Network at the Combine? Yeah. And it comes out and it'll say, like, you know, Johnny Smith ran a, a, a 4-3-1 and everyone loses their mind. And then later in the day, the official numbers come out from the, you know, from the, t- the actual timing. Yep. And the, the electronic. And it's a, a, a 4 4 9 So that's the difference. People just get tr- trigger happy with their thumbs. Or with their their index finger working the uh, working the stopwatch, but but anyway, the the uh, to your point, this year's class is yes, it's lean and it's not a bun- it's not a ton of perimeter guys, but the speed and then the the amount of, of slot receivers that bring versatility, it's special. I mean, Jamar Chase is is unique, and it. At the end of the season, I, I was like, yeah, Devontae's going to be the number one pick. And he was uh, number one wide receiver off the board because he's 
uh, he just he's coming off the best season that I've ever seen and maybe in the history of college football single season for a wide receiver won the Heisman did what he had to do and and they they lost Jalen uh, Waddle at Alabama and he he just kind of took over but then I went back to 2019 and watched Jamar Chase set single season SEC records at at wide receiver with Justin Jefferson, who I think he had what 88 catches for Minnesota this past year yep. as a, as a rookie. And, and just, he was the guy and he, he's just so physical and dominant in terms of getting off press and, and separating and, and after the catch, but then you got Devonte Smith, who's undersized, but explosive. You've got Jalen Waddell, who's a, again, a, a slot receiver that you can move around and do a bunch of different things with. And I think he's the most explosive player in this draft when you put the ball in his hands and give him a, he doesn't even need a little space, but once, once he has it in his hands, but then just going down the line, like Elijah Moore, the wide receiver from Ole Miss is so you know overlooked because he, he didn't play for a great team, but he, he's the fourth best receiver in this class. Yeah, and and then you get Kadarius Tony from from Florida, That's Rondale awesome. Moore, yep. um, Rondale Moore from from Purdue, uh, Tutu Atwell from Louisville. I mean, we had uh, was it fourteen? I think fourteen receivers taken in the first two rounds last year. It, I mean, yeah, it may have been thirteen. I think we could have 14 or 15 again this year. Wow. I mean, that's how that's how good this group is. Uh, who's the biggest butt guy in this draft? And before you answer, you're going to get bonked, so I'm going to explain the question. When Nick Saban was saying that you have butts and you've got ands and you want to be an and guy, so when you're when uh, a coach is getting a call from a, pro- a professional team leading up to the draft, you say he can do this and he can do that because the stuff that comes after the butt, if you say he can do this but – that's when you start to get dinged. Who is the guy that has like the biggest butt in terms of like high upside, but watch out for this one big weakness in his game? Um, I'm glad you explained that because mm-hmm. I, I started to look at my list of players and trying to think of the big, <laughs> the biggest ass in this class. Well, yeah, you can do that you too. Can definitely, it, do it that. might be the same guy because yeah. I don't know. Maybe you're gonna maybe you're gonna say it's Sewell. I don't maybe know. Maybe his ass is too big and that's the butt. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> to, to answer your original question, I'm gonna go with uh, Jason Oa from the, the the edge rusher from Penn State. I mean, this guy he ran I think a four three eight at his pro day he's 255 plus pounds and he has all the physical tools that you look for but he didn't have a sack he didn't have a sack last year i I mean i it's 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 hard and he had a lot of pressures and you can look up you know the pff numbers in terms of pressures and hits and all these different things but he didn't get home and if i'm gonna draft a guy in the first round and i i love the traits and i love the physical tools but Jason Owe from, from Penn State to me is, is one of the hardest evaluations simply because if you can't get a sack as an edge rusher, then, then what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All, all but no sack. That is, that's big. What, what, here's <laughs> another but I want to throw out to you. Uh, Trey Lance, obviously people love him, but he's only played one season. So how do you evaluate that? Like how do you, how do you sit there and like he's only played one season. I don't want to – bring up bad memories, but the last guy who only played one season, Mitch Trubisky, it didn't work out that well because he only had one season to look at and be like, here's how he does against this competition. Yeah, it, it's tough, man. I mean, Trubisky, Mark Sanchez is another one. That If you study the history of the quarterback position in the draft, one of the greatest correlations between being drafted and having success in the NFL is starts, which sounds crazy, right? But, you're, I mean, things are – they've kind of changed with the transfer portal, with obviously this past year with, with COVID and some of the limitations. It wasn't his fault. Like, he had no if – they, if they played 10 games, he would have played 10 games. Right. They, they played one. But the biggest problem is he started 17 games at the FCS level. Then you watch the tape, though, and you see a guy whose accuracy needs to improve. That he has everything else that you look for in terms of the size, the competitiveness, the leadership, the toughness, the mobility, extending plays, the ability to drive the ball down the field vertically. So I, I just, I would love, for his sake, I would love to see Trey Lance wind up 
in either San Francisco or even better Atlanta. Okay. And I don't, I don't think Atlanta is going to take him. But, but the reason I say that is, is exactly to your point. He needs time and, and he needs to Patrick Mahomes came in the league and his mechanics were a mess. He, he, he came from a scheme that air raid offense that, that really didn't translate, especially at the time. And he came in and, and I did the, the chiefs games for, um, for two or three years, the preseason games. And I remember sitting down and talking to him and he's like, Todd, I got to be honest with you. I, I didn't know how to identify the Mike linebacker. I, it was nothing. It was something I had never had to do in my career. And like, that's the, one of the simplest things you learn that in high school, like there, there's the middle linebacker and that ha- helps to set protection for the offensive line and so on and so forth. So he's like, if I didn't have this first year to sit back and have a quarterback in Alex Smith, that was willing to actually work with me and talk to me about how to be a pro and what to look for and the coverages and all those things and didn't have Andy Reid and this coaching staff. I just, I wouldn't be where I am now. And and now you can make the argument that he's the best player in the NFL. Yeah. Where, where did you have Patrick Mahomes in that draft? Way too low. Don't bring it up. <laughs> okay. That's, that's why you brought that up. Because late, it's in the, f- late, late in the first round. I, I he, he was, and, and I said it at the time, I said it, a bunch of times he was the toughest quarterback I've ever had to evaluate because here, here's what happens. So you sit down and especially with the quarterbacks, normally with, with other positional players, you watch six, seven games throughout the course of a year. And then in the draft process with the quarterbacks, you have to watch basically every game unless it's against an opponent that doesn't matter. And so I, I sat there and I, I was so worried about like his footwork was off. Every time he went to throw, he was, it looked like a, a shortstop, like, or throwing underhand. His, his, he was, he, his feet were, were so far away from what you want mechanically. But then I would look down on my notes and it would be like completion, completion, right. <laughs> you know, a, a perfect ball placement. And I just, I, I didn't know how to process that at the time. Because he did everything wrong before the ball got to the wide receiver. But the end result was always there. And then he got with a, in a situation where he had time to develop his footwork and get his timing right and, and to get away from that air raid system but get in a system where they kind of adapted to what he wanted to be. It just all worked out perfectly and throw in all the weapons that he has, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm not making excuses. I'm just I'm explaining the process. The process was brutal with him because I saw the talent, but I didn't know what to do with it. I like that spin zone though. You're like my evaluation was correct, and then after the first year, if if he had re-entered the draft after a year sitting behind Alex Smith, you would have had him first overall, right? Of course. Yeah. 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 yeah easy. Done. And done. And, <laughs> and and my evalu- my evaluation wasn't correct. Brett Brett Veach is the the GM of of Kansas City. His, his was correct. And apparently, and I, I talked to him about this and, and to Andy Reid and just a couple other people in, on their staff. Apparently, Brett had basically decided we're taking this guy when he's eligible next year. It was the year before. I forget the year that he was drafted. It was, what, four or five years ago. But it, it was the year before his final season in college when he, he w- walked into Andy's office and was like, this is, this is going to be our guy. We got to get this guy. And that's why they made that big move to go up and get him. That's mm-hmm. crazy. Um, so my last question, do you ever – this might be a stupid question. Do you ever think that some of the front offices are cheating off your work? Like, do they call you and then you give them your evaluation and then you're like, wait, I think they took that guy because of me. That would be a pretty cool thing, right? <laughs> no, they definitely don't. Yeah. The only thing they do – they it, it's funny because I, I don't – I, I mean, I have friends in the league and we talk, but we talk about like family vacations or what's going on. How, how is it on the road and, and stuff like that? We don't really start talking about where guys are going until about 10 days before. And that's why I have spent more time on the phone the last four or five days with, with guys in the league than, than I have probably in the last four or five months because they, they, they're all trying to figure out what I'm hearing and where guys are, are projected to go. And they're, they're taking that information. I'm sure they're calling Kuiper and, and Daniel Jeremiah, and then they're calling other guys in the league. Steven Shea. Get, 
Yeah. <laughs> they, they want Exactly. They want to get all the information they can get to try to figure out, okay, if, if, if we're going to move out of this spot, if we're going to try to trade up to go get a guy, or can we, can we hang it, pick eight or nine or whatever it is, or, do, or we, should we move back because we can still get that guy and pick up an additional pick? That's, that's probably the biggest thing um, in terms of my conversations with guys in the league and, and how they could utilize that information. And I, I got to be careful. I, I never talk specifics in terms of players and I protect every, all, everything that, you know, everything I'm hearing in, in terms of when teams tell me we want this guy. But, but um, you know, even today I told a, a certain team that I had talked to another team and that you might want to reach out to, to this other team uh, because if, if it gets to – if there's a certain player, and I didn't say the player, but if there's a certain player there, they may want to move up. And so you should probably have some dialogue with them. Huh. Hmm, I'm trying to, I'm trying like to do the math real quick. It would, the Falcons, the Dolphins, and uh, Ian Book. Did I get it? <laughs> exactly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Crush in it. round three. Crush it. I've got uh, just one last thing because we we love all the lingo and all the scout talk that goes into the draft. All the different like you guys almost talk in a secret language sometimes. And when we can pick up on like a new phrase that's coming out and get ahead of that, we like to feel smart. So are there any like any deep scout terms that you guys use to describe players that maybe you just keep to yourself? And you haven't put out there in the media yet, or don't say publicly. Some just basically some a cool phrase that we can steal from you about a player. Mm. Um, I don't know. I I think I've used this on air, but you you probably haven't heard it. But I my I I find myself using this all the time now when I'm talking about defensive backs that are smooth. That they have oily hips. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or greasy hips, one of the two. You know, just when you see, you can just kind of see how when you compare the, like the oily guys versus the stiff guys, it's so obvious to see on tape. And that, that's the best way I can describe it. Greasy or oily, just, you know, so smooth that they're, they're not laboring. Um, and, then, and then with offensive linemen that really struggle, and defensive linemen too, that struggle to redirect, I always call it the Titanic and it's like, <laughs> uh -huh. yep. you know, like good luck turning that thing. Yeah. The DK I Metcalf. Like that. I yeah. like that. Um, <laughs> well, Todd, th er, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, good luck on Thursday night. Uh, I appreciate don't it, stop, guys. Don't stop giving Mel shit about being a weirdo with his pizza and his pumpkin pies. Mashed potatoes. Yeah. Mashed and, potatoes. Yeah. No, no I mean, debit kind of, card. What kind of animal? <laughs> What kind of animal goes to the hotel room every single night after after doing shows, orders a pizza and takes the cheese off? First of all, what are we what are we doing? Yeah. And then and then gets a, a side of mashed potatoes and slaps the mashed potatoes on top and and uses that as, as the cheese. He's going to so you've lost. Yeah, you've lost 80 percent of the sauce. Uh -huh. You've lost all of the cheese. And now you're you're double carb loading on 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 you know, crust and mashed potatoes. He's going to live to like a thousand though. He's going to have the same life. I, uh, yeah. I was, uh, you beat me to it. Yeah. I was just going to say, and, and, and then he wakes up and has pumpkin pie every morning and thinks that he's having something healthy because he has the, the fat free uh, whipped cream. Yep. And he's going to wind up, uh, he's going to outlive me by 30 years. We yep. have to have him do a pizza review with Dave. Yeah. That would be Mashed so potatoes. funny oh. if they walked out and Dave and before, would lose yeah. his <laughs> freaking if, if we didn't mind. tell him to and he just walks yeah, out and just it, rips the cheese off and yeah. slaps mashed potatoes and Dave's just like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that honestly, I I would watch it and laugh my ass off. Oh my God, we got to have that. <laughs> I mean, to Mel's credit, you did you did really botch the pumpkin pie a couple years ago on the I air. Did. When I did. You, I know. You I have to I've go looked back. I've checked the tape. I've studied it. You have to <laughs> the go. The eye in the sky doesn't lie, right? Slice, spray, eat. Like individual bites get individual dollops of whipped cream on them, right? And you just yeah, you I've went in like a savage a, and put the whipped cream on the entire pie at once. I was trying, I was trying to do right by him, but I I, <laughs> I messed it up. That, that was one, that was one of my biggest draft fails. <laughs> oh man! All right, well, Todd, thanks so much, man. We look forward to uh, draft night on Thursday. All right, fellas, take care. Todd McShay is brought to you by our great friends at Bird Dogs. Shorts are back. Yeah. Bird Dogs are back, big time. 
was rocking some bird dogs earlier today. Went to the gym. That's just a fact. Wore my bird dogs. They're the best workout shorts that you will ever put on. They've got the underwear sewn into them. It's perfect. It's great if you go to the gym before work. If you want to get a, a workout in right afterwards, it, uh, it eliminates one extra thing that you'll have to pack with you to go to the gym and get that workout in. Plus, you can wear them as swimsuits too. It's warming up. It's almost summer. Bird dogs are back. Mark Cuban passed on bird dogs on Shark Tank. And it's allegedly been his biggest missed investment aside from owning Big Cat's brain. We love bird dog shorts. Mark, if you still want to get involved, they want us to pitch you bird dogs. I think that you could do a whole lot worse than investing in bird dog shorts. I wear them all the time. All the time. If I'm wearing shorts, I'm wearing bird dogs. That's a fact. You're not going to believe the giveaway that they have. You can go to birddogs.com, enter promo code TAKE, and they're going to throw in a free pair of Bird Dogs rubber ventilated shoes. They're just Crocs, but apparently for legal reasons, they can't call them Crocs. That's birddogs.com, promo code TAKE, and boom, you get a free pair of Bird Dogs rubber ventilated shoes with your pair of Bird Dogs. You can rock them in what, sport mode? Yep. Sport mode or in casual mode? Is that the other name for them? Slipper mode. Slipper mode or sport mode. Uh, but Bird Dogs is throwing in a free pair. If you want to go ahead and use promo code TAKE, you're going to get that free pair of Bird Dogs rubber ventilated shoes only at BirdDogs.com. The official shorts of shorts. Uh, yes. I just I tossed that one in there at the end. That's great. Take that, Bird Dog. Run with that. The official shorts of shorts. Um, I'm not crazy that the Oscars was not supposed to be tonight, right? I didn't know it was tonight. Is that usually in February? I don't think that any movies came out this year. That's the big King Kong Godzilla, and they didn't even put it in there. Well, that just came out. I know, but that was last year. How is that not in Mortal Kombat? They should have just known that it was going to come out. Oscars is usually like March Madness. Yeah, right. Isn't it like late February? This one just I I thought it already happened. They they switched the Oscars in the draft this year, and then I went been last week. Oscars next week, and then I just walked out to the. to the main part of the office and Jeff D. Lowe and Ken Jack had like looked Battle like station. Ne- yeah, it looked mm-hmm. like they were landing Elon Musk's fucking rockets. The command center. It looked <laughs> like that it looked like that guy that was landing the the uh expedition rover or whatever on Mars from his house. Yeah, I was the, like, what is going on here? Like, oh, Oscars tonight. Like, oh, like, like, didn't that happen? Yeah, the usually 2019 Oscars were in February or tw- tw- February 24th, 2019. Yeah, so it's always in February. So what the fuck? Why are they still are the Oscars still lagging from COVID? Get your shit together, Oscars. I, I bet you I mean, that movie th- studios had to shut down for an entire year. Yeah, again. this year there's going to be like no movies out. If you want to get a, a movie nominated for an Oscar, this is the year to do it. Boner dogs. Boner dogs. Eat pray chug. Eat pray chug, Billy. <laughs> how, how Billy got his, how Billy got his chug back. I love it, Billy. You should do it. Um, yeah, that surprised me. All right, we should do. Uh, we got a Monday reading. So Monday reading. This one is a lot about the picture of this guy, but. Uh, In the Orlando Sentinel, the Monday reading is, I love Disney World, but wokeness is ruining the experience. So this is by Jonathan Van Van Buskirk. Sick name, John. I think I'm going to actually agree with this guy eventually. I mean, if you look at the picture of him, I don't think that you're going to be able to match his Disney knowledge. So he has a picture, and it's off-centered, but behind him is a bunch of, like, Disney figurines. I don't even know what you call them. What do, what do you call a doll uh, when you're an adult? They're collectibles. Because I don't think you can call it a doll. I think they're... What are they? I think they're just collectibles. Yeah. Investment. Investments. Yeah. Okay. Because you know what I'm saying. Like, kids can have dolls. Adults have... Mannequins. Mannequins. Decorations. Figurines. Yeah. Dudekins. Yes. Ask Jeff D. Lowe. Yeah, that's true. He does have a lot of... Sex, Figurines. Sex dolls. Yeah. And such. All right, here we go. My family and I have been loyal Disney customers for decades. We vacation at Disney World every year. We take a Disney cruise every year or two. Consequently, we spend way too much money in Orlando. So this is right off the bat. This guy's dedicated. Mm -hmm. And Disney people are freaks. I don't like the fact that he is acknowledging that he has a problem, though. Yeah. He seems like a little bit too aware of the fact that he does spend too much time thinking about Disney World. Yeah. Like, Disney cruises, that's... I get why you would want to go to Disney World or Disneyland occasionally, but to be trapped on a boat with other adult Disney fans, that's like hell is other people. Hell is other stands of the Jungle Book. You yes. Know? I, I'm doing the math, though, here. How fucking lit are the years where he goes double dipping? Because he said we take a Disney, we, we vacation at Disney World every year. We take a Disney cruise every year or two. 
So there are years where he's double dipping, and it's like a nonstop Wonderland. Yeah. Is that what it, Disney is, Wonderland? D- Disneyland or Disney World. The most magical place on earth. Which one is which? What do you call World the is Orlando, Land is California. Got it. I have never, I have, haven't been to either. I was that kid who didn't go to either. Uh, unfortunately, I am strongly rethinking our commitment to Disney and thus Orlando. This is now we're talking about now we're talking about some fucking dollars in Orlando's pockets. How much money do you think this guy drops in Orlando in a given year? A shitload. Probably, I'd say five figs. Yeah, uh, mid five figs. Mid five figs, probably <laughs> for sure. <laughs> the more Disney moves away from the values and vision of Walt Disney, the less Disney World means to me. Disney is forgetting that guest immersion is at the core. That's a buzzword, by the way. That's going to come back up. Guest immersion is at the core of its business model. When I stand in Galaxy's Edge or Fantasyland, I know I'm in a theme park. But through immersion and my willingness to set the real world aside, something magical happens. The spell is broken when the immersive experience is shattered by the real world. And boy... Has Disney been breaking that immersion? So he he finds himself in Disneyland frequently or Disney World frequently, and just pointing out, "Hey, this isn't right. This this is not what Walt Disney had in mind." I've read right. several of his biographies. Right. Like, why does Mickey Mouse have a hearing aid? Yeah. Why is wait? Why is Mickey Mouse not an actual mouse? Right. Exactly. Why does Mickey Mouse uh, have a tin of skull in his pocket? Uh, why is Mickey Mouse wearing pants and Donald Duck isn't? Can I see Donald Duck's penis? Good question. I also think there's a there's a ten uh, percent chance this guy just learned the word immersion and was like, I'm going to use this uh-huh. in a piece. I don't like I don't like the vibe that he gives in the picture because it almost seems like. He's going for a Jimmy Buffett parrot head type vibe. Right. He's wearing the Hawaiian shirt. I don't think adult Disney fans are Hawaiian shirt type guys. Yeah. If they are, then I might have to reconsider my stance on the Hawaiian Become shirt. Become one? I. This also, you know, maybe I'm way off, and I'm sure we'll piss off some Disney people, but isn't it for kids? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Traditionally, right. yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> immersion, really, immersion is just being a child. Like, this is this is. Uh, a park for kids. This guy just wants to be immersion. a child again. Children, yeah, are that's your whole life is immersion. Yes, everything uh, is fantastic. It's probably amazing. Mm-hmm. Aren't sports just a kids' game? Shut up, Hank. No, no, uh-uh. it's different no, because the yeah. players care as much as I do. Yeah, not even close. They, yes, Hank. It's real no. life. They're playing the game. It's real to me. It's absolutely real. Bad analogy. Bad. I, Hank. I, Bad. Wasn't that I bonk. was asking? Not horny bonk. Bad bonk. A question. Immersion shattering bonk. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer over your head like you were a cartoon. Ca- I'd drop an anvil on your head. I'd drop a <laughs> piano on your head if you walk by me right now. Just All right. Some questions. Recently, Disney announced that cast members are now permitted to display tattoos, wear inclusive uniforms, and display inclusive haircuts. Disney did all of this in the name of allowing cast members to express themselves. Now is where I kind of actually agree with him. I'm so- starting to turn here. <laughs> Right, I I like if, probably if, don't want to see like uh, Ariel. If Snoopy's got is Snoopy, Snoopy's definitely Disney. Is he? No, no. no. <laughs> what is a uh, Toy Story? Peanuts. What dog am I talking about? Pluto. Pluto. If uh-huh. Pluto's got a fu- Goofy, that's Goofy, what I was talking. Goofy. About. If Goody, Goofy's got a fucking like scorpion tattoo on his arm, I'm gonna be pissed. I I would kind of love that honestly. No, as, I, an, as an adult, I would love to see Goofy walking around <laughs> like carrying a openly carrying a knife on his hip. Has a t- has a barbed wire tattoo <laughs> and just chain smoking. I think I'm on this. I think I'm on Johnny Boy's uh, side here. All right, here we go. The problem is I'm not traveling across the country and paying thousands of dollars to watch someone I do not know express themselves. I am there for the immersion in the fantasy, not the reality of a stranger's self-expression. I do not begrudge these people their individuality, and I wish them well in their personal lives. But I ne- do not get to express my individuality at my place of business. I what? yeah, I'm gonna throw a flag there. I don't think Jonathan Jonathan really gonna tell us that he's never gone to work in a Disney shirt. That's a good point. Jonathan gonna tell me that he doesn't have Disney fucking dolls at his desk. I'm gonna throw a flag on that one, Johnny boy. Also, if you work at like Target, um, are you expected to immerse yourself <laughs> in being a Target employee? Like when you when you walk into the store, are you just eat sleeping? You're acting out just like. The entire mission statement of Target, yeah. all the time. Yes, or uh, Best Buy, the Geek Squad. That is true. No, they're definitely nerds. Yeah, yeah they all have to be immersed uh-huh. into the nerd. You know what? The more I stuff. think about it, the more I do like going to places where there's immersion. Yes. No, it's. I'm kind of 
on his side, but I do want to say you're a hypocrite because if you're an adult Disney fanatic, there's a 0% chance you're not an adult Disney fanatic at your place of work as well. Yes, everyone right? knows. Like, not to pick on Jeff D. Lowe, he's got a bunch of dolls on his desk. I love it. Mm -hmm. I think it's his individuality. I think that we're at a place where you can express your individuality. But if Jeff D. Lowe was uh, uh, an accountant at uh, one of the big three, big four, big three? Uh, big three. Big three? It just always sounds better. Yeah. <laughs> if he was an accountant at the big three, he would definitely have a couple, you know, what are those things called? Bop tours? Uh, Funko Pops. Fun <laughs> Jesus Christ. This is I'm, I'm out of my depth here. I don't know what any of this shit is called. What Inorganic lovers. What? That's. Are you talking about sex dolls? Yeah. Okay. Inorganic lovers. Right. What's next? Is Disney going to end the rule bearing on stage cell phone use by cast members as an infringement on self expression? Good point. Mm -hmm. I love Slippery that. Slow. Whenever somebody starts a sentence with what's next, you can be sure that like the, the fiery takes from the depth of hell inside their brain are coming next. Yes. It's like, I'm going to get weird with it. Yep. So he's saying that if you let them. Uh, have a tattoo Next thing you know They're going to be calling Their drug dealer on yes. stage I'm finding out quickly That I know nothing about Disney Because I'm tr I'm struggling to figure out Is Aladdin Disney? Aladdin is yes, Disney Yes Aladdin's Disney Oh so it's Beauty and the Beast It's Aladdin Snow White Snow White Little Mermaid Little Lion Mermaid. King Okay alright Lion King good Alright yeah. I got it I'm on Disney Alright more broadly, like many corporations, Disney has been politicizing its business. Full disclosure, I'm a Christian and a conservative Republican, so the people who run Disney and I do not see eye to eye. I actually appreciate that. He's just saying, hey, look, I know they think differently than me. All right, regardless. Yeah, I do like that. I like the fact that uh, until, He's not hiding it. until they took away his immersion, you can still do business with people that you don't agree with right. on everything because you're never, spoiler alert, you're never going to completely agree with anybody about anything ever. Right. I, they came for, for Jonathan's immersion and I said nothing. Yes. That's a that's a problem. All right. Regardless, corporations have always made politically motivated decisions. Usually it is due to the desire to make a profit, but sometimes it is due to the values of the people in the corporation. Walt Disney used his corporation to express his patriotism during World War II and his pro-capitalism beliefs afterward. The difference today is that the people who run Disney are social media uh, use social media to scream to the whole world that a decision has been made for political reasons. Disney is in the process of taking the woke scalpel to the Jungle Cruise. Uh oh, Trader that Sam. That's not a good sentence. No, no, the <laughs> woke scalpel. Trader Sam is out because he might offend certain people. Every grown up in the room realizes that Trader Sam. Who is? Let's Google Trader Sam Trader real Sam. quick. Trader seems like a, a I euphemism. Is this or maybe? He is was in the, the business of uh, uh, of relocating people. So he's a slave trader. That's Yeah, I would say that's fair to, to pull that one. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to find a picture of Trader Sam. He's from the Jungle Cruise. He's from the Jungle Cruise. Oh, okay. Yeah, Trader Sam. Yeah, no, Trader Sam, that was probably a good call. <laughs> that was a good call by Disney. I'm going to side with Disney on that one. Trader Sam is uh, every grown up in the room realizes that Trader Sam is not a representation of reality and is meant as a funny and silly character. Again, I think it's for the kids. Yeah, I think I don't think the uh, the grown ups wasn't wasn't Walt Disney wasn't he into like eugenics. Yeah, I think so. he was a low key. Yeah, Nazi. low key, was low key, key not Nazi? so good. Yeah, um, it's the worst kind. He's essentially asking for immersion into a more racist time. <laughs> yeah, just immersion, but it's immersion. It's immersion, guy. okay, all right, all right. It is no more based in racism than every Disney character of an out-of-touch white American dad. Yes, now that rules. Uh -huh. That rules what he just did. Because you make the fucking white American dads fat, and that's not cool. Most of us are fat, not all of us. Uh, the next time I ride Jungle Cruise, I will not be thinking about the gloriously entertaining puns of the skipper. <laughs> I will be thinking about Disney's political agenda. That's a mood killer. Uh -huh. Agre I'm going to agree. I'm, I'm going back and forth here, but... If you can't enjoy this puns by the skipper, you're right. You've you've been immersion has been broken, and I, I bet that he's probably heard the exact same puns uh, probably hundreds of times. Yeah, but, but it's they're still, still funny. But still, when you're immersed in them and you yeah. hear the puns, you're genuinely excited by them. Yes, like I I appreciate good writing. Yes. Um. All right. Disney proclaims that Splash Mountain must change because of its association with Song of the South. Disney owns Splash Mountain, so it can do what it wants. But if Disney screams at the top of its corporate voice which is pretty loud that it is changing it to appease a certain political point of view now every time i look at the ride i'm thinking about politics i think that's a you problem dude i also in that you like look at a ride well 
it's you problem that you're going to Disney as an adult. I don't even know if this guy has kids. Right. If if you make anything that important in your life, you're going to be disappointed by something. From something. It. Right. Yeah. Very exactly. much. Exactly. So yeah, this guy. Um, we need to get a, a baseline of what politics is. Correct. I feel like people just say like this is politics, politics. <laughs> about anything they disagree with. Um. All right. So he goes on to say. Pirates used to be one of my favorite attractions. My family... Oh, he does have family. Okay. Would always ride... It's like... It's he, his wife, and... Uh, like five dolls. Yeah, right. He, uh, he buckles up. My family would always ride it first on our first day at the Magic Ki- Kingdom. Now we do not even ride it every trip. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> so he's kind of... He's, he still he's goes. admitting that he's still doing Yeah, it. he still goes, but Big Cat, it's not every time. <laughs> okay, when my family rides Pirates now, each of the change scenes takes us out of the illusion... Because they remind us of reality and the politics of force that changes. <laughs> I like how he's like, hey, where's that thing? Oh, fuck. Immersion broken. He's like, how come Uncle Remus doesn't work in the character breakfast anymore? Bringing me my orange juice. <laughs> Dude, he really needs to, like, he just needs to take a break from Disney World. He's 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 burnt he's, out. He's yeah. memorized the shit too much. Yeah. That's the problem. It's like, if you can notice the slightest change in a uh, theme park, maybe you go too much. So... I think at some point, um, for most people, when they were, t- if they were experiencing these rides, they would probably reach the level of like, oh, I don't believe the immersion anymore. Maybe after the second time or third time, because you start to learn the routine, yeah, and it's not exciting or new anymore. This guy just has an insanely high tolerance for repetition and right. immersion, right? So he like, it just it. T- it, there's a part of his brain that doesn't get bored with repetition <laughs> until like fifty or sixty times through, and even then, still not fully. Uh, so he ends it with Disney World is going to lose us as customers if it continues down the path. I do not want to have Disney World taken away from us because Disney cares more about politics than happy guests. The parks are less fun because immersion and thus the joy is taking a backseat to politics. Did he please return to the values of uh, and vision of Walt? The customer experience should be the core of your business model. Immersion should not be sacrificed on the altar of political uh, correctness and appeasing the Twitter mob. I actually think this guy might rule. So I like. Any- I think he might rule. I think I might be a fan of his. I, I like anyone who's that passionate about right. something that I don't care about at all. That's right. Why I, I, I like his brain. I now, I think the fact that he spends this much time thinking about Disney is weird, but also kind of cool because I don't know. It's just cool to be that excited about anything. It's cool to have people that care more about a company's product than the actual company. Correct. Does. Correct. Those people are fascinating to me. Now there was. Um, a, a counterpoint, a rebuttal that oh, was published no. in the same newspaper, the Orlando Sentinel, by Cody Vincitore. His article, I also love Disney World, and here's why wokeness critic is wrong. And then oh, he wrote he wrote sucks. a response letter no. fact-checking the uh, grooming standards and things like that, where he was like, they won't, they won't uh, fire somebody if they have a small tattoo. He's downplaying the immersion. I don't Got think it. I don't think this guy understands the concept of immersion. We might have to take a trip to, to, to judge get, for to, ourselves. Yeah, to get immersed and figure out how far this immersion goes or or stops. Mm-hmm. I I just love anyone who's this passionate about anything. Yep. He fucking wrote. He not only spends mid five figs on Disney every year. He wrote a fucking commentary article being like they're about to lose those mid five figs. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the, the crux of the response one is just saying, like, if you can't deal with uh, organizations that treat cast members with basic human decency and respect, we don't want your vacation dollars. So, like, I don't think he has the authority to say that on behalf of no, he definitely Walt doesn't. Disney. He definitely doesn't. You don't know. You can't put words into Walt Disney's cryogenically frozen head. They should also um, just any changes they should just make without announcing it because then the immersion stays real. Right. Like, don't say we let people have tattoos now. Just let it happen, and then the immersion isn't broken. I was. I think that's probably his. This guy, Jonathan, he has alerts on Google alerts for any change at Disney. So every time there's a change, whether he's there or not, the immersion is broken. And now, once you break his immersion over and over and over, mm-hmm. the guy's a broken man. I think what it comes down to is that this guy just longs for when he was a child. Yeah, he probably. just misses being a kid. Which again, it's a kid's. A- place. And so anything that changes, it takes him out of that feeling he had the first time he saw Ariel's seashell bra. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, just, it's like people who still think that the Dallas Cowboys are great because right. they won Super Bowls in the 90s. Right. And anytime something changes with the team, it shatters that immersion. Yes. But you, st- you still keep going and paying money. Yeah, what do you mean Jerry's not the best? Um, I Last last homework assignment for the listeners, I would love to hear from 
a fully immersed Disney fan and let us know if it is true the immersion has been broken. Yeah. Or I do think this guy rules like on just the base level. Take all politics out. I just think his life weirdly rules because he's like able to get excited about shit. I love weirdos. Yeah. Right. Weirdos that, that are passionate about things. I'd love that to have on about. the show. They're fascinating. I would... I'd also like to hear from somebody who works at Disney who is a character that takes pride in the immersion. Immersion, yeah. And, like, when you can tell if somebody's in a current state of being immersed. And I'd when like you to have him on the show, too, but to keep it stay in the immersion. You say immersion, yeah. Right. We'll just do a show right. where it's, like, Gaston. Right. Just talking Speak shit to French. this guy. Right. He's like, yeah, yeah, slap me in the face, daddy. Yeah, okay. All right, so it's a lot of homework out there. Um, good show, guys. Degrade me. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Degrade me, cousin. What were you going to say, Billy? Well, could, like, Gaston have, like, a, a controversial tattoo? Mm. So, what would be controversial about Gaston? I don't know. Let's say he was, like, a... He's a member of the bourgeoisie? Yeah, mm -hmm. he's bourgeoisie. Would that That's be true. Cool? I don't know. Yeah. Also, how do you get so jacked? Exactly. There were no gyms. It would be funny if Disney went, like, over the top with inclusiveness... And they let like scrawny dudes become Gaston. Oh, that like, would we fucking. Got, that, I'd that riot with Jonathan. Really I'd riot with yeah, Jonathan. I would too. Yeah, I'd be like, fuck. I want, I want my Gaston to be like over the top, jacked as fuck. Yeah. Actually, like, I want Gaston to assault people in front of me. Yeah. I, That's I, what immersion means to me. I'm on Jonathan's side, though. I think he rules. <laughs> Come on the show. Tell us about immersion because, like, your life. People will laugh at your life, and I do think Disney, adult Disney people are kind of freaks, but that's okay. Everyone let their freak flag fly. And it's good to have freaks out there because it allows you to feel good about yourself. Even though we're freaks we're definitely of freaks our own for, way. For doing a podcast talking about a guy who's Right, a and also just like the amount of sports we consume. No, we're freaks. no, no. Yeah. Hank's, Hank's got to you. Hank's got that. Hank, you're a freak for how many, uh, how much video games you play. You're a freak for putting ice cubes on your dog's penis. No, no. That's just a good dog owner. 99. <laughs> 38. Eight. 18. 32. Slow lorises are venomous. What is a slow loris? Where There's those found? like really cute lemurs with the big eyes. Oh, um, how are they? Ve 94. How are they venomous? They, they have saliva that uh, makes people go into anaphylactic shot. Holy That's shit. That's a sick superpower. First 94 since opening day on August 27th. Since oh, opening day. day. First day you did it. Love it. When we were on pace to have we like did like 12 360. On that day. Yeah. yeah, shit. Love you guys.